All right, welcome to Magic Without Fears, the Hermetic Podcast with Frater RC, and uh, good to good to have you on today. You're uh, you're where are you coming from? Uh, thank you, Frater RC. I really appreciate you having me on. I'm speaking to you live. My name is Johan, and I'm from Kansas City, Missouri. Although I immigrated to the U.S., I'm not originally from from the United States. Wow, Kansas, and uh, where where are you from originally? Uh, originally, I grew up in the Middle East, and I immigrated to the United States, and uh, probably when I was around 28, 29, I kind of upped and left uh, Oman and moved to the United States, and uh, yeah, kind of made a made a go of it over here lived in New York for about a year and um, after living over there it was too expensive so I eventually moved to the Midwest and I live in Kansas City Missouri very cool I I, I, I did get to spend some time in Brampton and Springfield when I was uh, young like 91 so uh, yeah it's a it's an interesting part of the world right on yeah yeah I know where that is so uh, very excited to talk to you because you've just uh, you've just got your Kickstarter approved, correct? It's it's reached its thing. I don't know much about Kickstarter. I think you're actually the first guest I've had on who is in the midst of a Kickstarter. So that's that's something to talk about. And it's it's about geomancy and geomancy dice, correct? Exactly. I uh, yeah. And to to give you an update, we uh, set a fairly ambitious goal, and we are fully funded. Congratulations. Yeah, I know one of my students was very keen when I showed him the Kickstarter or when Foolish Fish showed it and stuff, and uh, he, he jumped on it and uh, all that. So, Thank yeah, you. shout out from uh, from David to you in case you've come across him. I think he's chatted with you. They look beautiful. They look absolutely gorgeous. I mean, of course, Foolish Fish already did a fabulous job, I think, talking about them, if I remember correctly. Yeah, Denny, Denny featured my project on his uh, esoteric roundup. It was um, terribly kind of him to go off and do that. And uh, yeah, I, I really did get a really warm reception from a lot of folks. And I was just really happy that there was that, that level of enthusiasm for a uh, geomantic Kickstarter because tarot just seemed to be um, the thing that everyone seems to do. And um, just to have people embrace geomancy as a as a divination system, just you know, I, irrespective of whether they bought something from me or not, just to see the interest in it, that I really did find that uh, very heartening. So I really appreciate it. Yeah, no, it's 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 great. Um, I know in the in in my world in in the Golden Dawn world. The uh, geomancy is definitely not uh, not strange to us. Uh, Stephen Skinner's put out a lot of work on geomancy. Nick Farrell has recently put out some stuff on geomancy, and of course, we we get tested and trained on it for years. Like I had to do it for three grades, like theoricus practicus and philosophus. I had to study and get write exams, practical and theoretical, on geomancy for years, um, even though it wasn't really a, a love of mine. So. So this is going to be fun for me because it's not really one of the things I took to and really enjoyed, but yet I still had to study it to the extent that I knew it and could do it rather well. So I think that's a fun uh, uh, setup for this conversation, you know? No, absolutely. And I, I, I do appreciate Nick Farrell's book, Star and Stone. Uh, he he did cover some aspects of geomancy that I really do appreciate. Uh, namely, he covered the moon mansions because I've seen um, pieces of vintage, uh, or not vintage, like their antique geomantic calling plates and they featured the moon mansions. And I just wasn't really sure about how that fit in with geomancy, even though I lived in the Middle East and growing up in Oman, there are people that do geomancy, or as they call it back home, El Marramal. And um, so I appreciate some of uh, Nick Farrell's work. It's, it's definitely a good book. And Stephen Skinner's uh, Terrestrial Astrology was, uh, you know, an amazing, amazing resource. 
I, I can't thank, you know, Stephen Skinner enough for putting uh, his works on geomancy out there, especially terrestrial astrology. That book just is amazing. Absolutely the best. What is it that that book adds to the study of geomancy? A lot of the things in Stephen Skinner's books kind of trace the history of geomancy, where in most folk practitioners, I guess you could say in Oman, you can ask them about the history of geomancy and like in the Middle East, geomancy is thought one on one. So literally you have one person who's a geomancer, he will get one student, maybe two at the most, but usually from just observation, it's one. And that knowledge is not in book form, it's relayed orally from master to student. So in those contexts, much of what I knew about geomancy is just verbal from people talking and listening to what they're doing. And even then, there are a lot of um, rules, I guess, on who somebody that is a geomancer or who they will accept as a student. For example, you can't be a womanizer, you can't drink, you can't smoke, you have to be a devout Muslim and so on before that person will take you on because it's not just divination, it's also, it's an esoteric practice. And before giving somebody that knowledge, they wanna make sure that this person has, I guess, the fortitude or the right stuff or their lifestyle is cogent with the knowledge they're about to receive. Where in Stephen Skinner's book, he goes into a lot of the history of geomancy and its roots and that's nothing that prior to, even from someone who lived in the Middle East, that's nothing that was widely available. You know what I mean? Like oh. all I knew is that this was an oral transmission master to student, uh, you know, and then there was the lore of where it came from. People will say it's the prophet Idris, and it was uh, Jibreel or Gabriel in English that relayed the information to Idris and, that was the start of geomancy. But beyond that, you don't know about other like North African forms of geomancy like Ifa or things like that, you know? So that information and that context is what Stephen Skinner's book was bringing to geomancy. Very cool. That actually makes me want to read it a lot more. Um, yeah, I was always sort of curious about it. But again, due to my lack of, love of geomancy which which hopefully will increase as we uh, after this conversation i mean i'm not opposed to you know liking it more than i do at all it's just you know there's a lot of areas in magic and you can't love them all right so uh, i was very curious to to learn more about the history and um its role i almost got more into it last a couple of years ago or in the last couple of years because i i i was uh helping some students as they work through a, a Golden Dawn self-initiation tradition book by the Ciceros. And I mm -hmm. noticed something it said in the geomancy section there. It might have been there, or you know, it might have actually been in Stephen Skinner and Francis King's Techniques of High Magic, which some of the information they don't agree with anymore is they believe is they've revised that his he, Stick Skinner's revised his views on. In one of those books, the point is in one of those books, I think it was in the the self-initiation the golden dawn tradition they mentioned geomancy being moved into oh yeah it was in that book because in they moved it into the zealotor earth working because they claimed it was connected with the gnomes so i mentioned to nick farrell oh i do want to get back into geomancy now that i know it's connected with the gnomes don't ask me why that's a thing for me but it was and and farrell's like no it's not connected with the gnomes at all that's completely wrong check out my book and my my new material on it and i was like dude unfortunately now that you've told me that it's not connected with that my interest has once again dropped off <laughs> you know because like yeah he didn't realize that that was what was reigniting my curiosity to alert to do it practice it more um and uh <laughs> so in his very kind uh info informing me of the veracity of that claim uh, it also removed my <laughs> my keenness so that's that's pretty funny i think um do you have any idea why someone might what, what do you think its connection is with uh the elements or the or what where do you think that kind of came from 
the idea that it was connected with the gnomes just because of its name or um well you know i cannot really pinpoint that um i i do know that some practitioners they do use um the prayer of the gnomes i believe it's by elias levi and they do use that uh, to open up their geomantic readings and so on if i had to warrant a guess i would say it's the fact that it's it's a physical practice you know from taking mm. actual st a stick and tapping it into the sand you know or um i've seen um some... yeah i really wanted to make a geomancy box like the one skinner describes in uh, techniques of high magic that sounded like a really fun thing to do oh yeah yeah absolutely it sounds like a very physical you know kind of thing to play around with uh, a lot of Nigerians also, they have these wooden um, kind of carved box. They're sort of circular. They're large, kind of almost like a wooden bowl. And they've got carvings all around them. And then basically they dab with their fingers. And then once they have everything, then they kind of do a geomantic shield with the, with the sand. So they literally fill up this bowl with sand. It's got carvings. And then they'll kind of um do the technique unconsciously of you know tapping into the sand so i think the fact that you know sand is utilized and that uh, it's a practice where people were uh, literally tapping into the earth with a stick and trying to get that information so it being from that context i could see it making a lot of sense that it would be um, a gnomic practice or a rooted practice to the earth but then geomancy also, the geomantic figures, they also have that elemental association of earth, air, fire, water. So that would also make sense. Although why earth would take prominence over the other elements, you know, if, again, if I would warrant a guess, I would say it would be because of the fact that, uh, you know, Idris, as the story goes, was walking along and he's you know dabbing you know just basically playing with a stick and making these divots in the ground and then uh jibreel basically you know comes to relay the information to him or that's how the lore goes at at any rate yeah yeah it's it's uh i mean yeah i can, I can definitely believe it's not something specially connected with the gnomes and the earth but but is a bit more complicated than that so the um the the dice you've you've got in your kickstarter is the kickstarter is mainly dice oh uh, no the kickstarter also includes a uh, a tool that i use in my own personal practice it is a geomantic calling plate and uh the brass dice are traditional it's a style of dice called Kira, and that's the kind that they use in the Middle East. So uh, you can also see on the Kickstarter page, I have included uh, other images of those kind of dice that are in museums right now. And I also included a geomantic calling plate because I wanted it to be a set for people as an incentive. So I took the tool that I use privately in my own practice of reading and I put that out there and I thought people would enjoy it uh, as a set. And I guess my instincts were right because the most sales that I've had have all been as a set. So I, I think people particularly like both items together. Yeah, that, that definitely makes sense. Um, I mean, they're beautiful. If people have, so people should definitely go check out the Kickstarter. There'll be link link below. And it, when how long, how much longer do they have to check that out to join the Kickstarter? Uh, two weeks? Yeah, yeah, as of today, we've got slightly less than two weeks. We've got um, 12 days to go. So, uh, so get, it on, get on it, people. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Uh, one of the things that um, really appealed to me, oh, and you might find this interesting since we're talking about Stephen Skinner. Um, so one of the things that got me into geomancy, ironically enough, was even though I was born in the Middle East and, you know, at least in rural parts of Oman, you know, there are still people that do geomancy, as well as in places like Pakistan, 
Um, really? Is, oh, in Pakistan, it's huge. Oh, my God. It is huge out there. Wow. So I'll, I'll tell you some anecdotes about how, how geomancy is used in Pakistan. But interestingly enough, um, from living in the Middle East, I completely dis completely dismiss geomancy as as a thing until on a my father's english so we my father was also um he was a uh, air force officer and you know as military men are want to do he was very dismissive of all things um supernatural and and whatnot uh, my mother who's arab is of course completely the opposite and um you know he would just basically dismiss it as you know superstition and nonsense and um, interestingly enough, when I had gone to London and I picked up a copy of Stephen Skinner's Techniques of High Magic and discovered geomancy in there, oh, wow. to, to my younger self, that lent it more credence. <laughs> huh. That's coming from, right, coming from Stephen Skinner, who was reporting on an Arabic a uh, form of divination, like I lived over there and I, I didn't lend it any students as a teenager. So I thought, no, I mean, if this is the case, why has no, you know, why is there anyone else doing it? You know, why is this just here? And then after I bought Stephen Skinner's Techniques of High Magic and he had um, a chapter on geomancy and then I also bought um, Paul Houston's Mastering Witchcraft and that also had a tract on geomancy in it. And then I was like, okay, they might be onto something. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, man. Uh, it's like, it's kind of, you know, it's, it's in the golden dawn, right? Like, like it's one of the things we have to, we have to study that so much. We have to memorize everything. We have to pass tests on everything that we have to learn how to practice it. It's just, it's one of the, the, it's pretty, it's a lot of work actually um, that we were put through. Um, which is funny since it's something that we, most people then don't use thereafter. A lot of people just don't get into it, but yet we have to learn it anything anyway, which I think of course is one of the strengths of the golden dawn tradition where you have to learn quite a bit about a lot of different things, whether you're into it or not. And I think that's a valuable thing just for the discipline and, and, you know, pedagogic value as, as a developing as a human person. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, I actually have a close friend out here in Kansas City, Missouri, and um, uh, this friend of mine is actually in the Golden Dawn, and I believe he, I think he teaches a part of the astrology curriculum, if I'm not mistaken, and he goes out to um, it's, uh, Austin, Texas, I believe, to occasionally help with teaching part of the astrology curriculum, if I'm not mistaken. But yeah, okay. there, there's, there are Golden Dawn members out here in Kansas City um, also. Yeah, uh, of course, of course. And I, 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 I'm, I guess I know which order he's probably with then in that case. But uh, there's a lot of people in Austin. I've got, that's where the majority of my magical friends are, I think, are in, in Austin, if, if I, as far as any one city goes. So uh, maybe LA. There's a lot of you know magic going on in those cities for some reason, but yeah, it's 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 interesting that it's such a big part of the GD curriculum. Though though I know very few adepts who make active use of it. Though the ones who do, of course, love it, and that's that's cool. Um, I do hope yeah. that uh, I'll find more of an interest in it after uh, as time goes on. I don't know. Maybe I will. Maybe I won't. Right? There, again, there's so many things in magic to study. It's a. Uh, it's easy to get distracted, um, but it's also fun to 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 learn, you know, develop new techniques. And what do you use geomancy for the most? If you were trying to get me, like, you know, as someone who already knows how to do it and has done it quite a lot, um, but isn't that much in love with it, what would you say? Is there a way? Do you have any any thoughts on how to seduce a practitioner back into its practice? Yeah, absolutely. Um, awesome. I can only tell you about my own experiences and how I use it. Perfect. And hopefully this will sell you on it. So the thing that I've, my, my focus on divination or my philosophy, if you will, is literally to maximize gain and minimize loss. At its core, it's that simple to me. And where I think a lot of things like 
tarot, and I, I'm not trying to pick a fight with anyone who's a tarot card reader. Um, so if anyone is listening and they think that I'm doing that, please, you know, don't think that at all, because that's the first form of divination I think most magic practitioners become familiar with. It's like my friend Brian Wilkins told me, uh, or he said recently, I think in a, in a podcast rather, that he would use geomancy for strategy and tarot for tactics. My own take on that, which, which is completely valid, you know, if you know both forms of divination, you can use it. But for me, I will use geomancy to know how something will play out, whether it's a course of action I should take. And also to explore if something does play out, what are the modalities of how that thing will play out? Will it play out in my favor? Will it play out in my favor, but I will regret it at the end. And geomancy can tell you that. It can give you those kind of answers. And also the blunt way that geomancy answers a question with giving you an answer upfront that I find it exceptionally useful because as a tarot card reader, you, you sometimes, you know, when you deal a spread, you can convince yourself, oh, well, it could mean this. If you're particularly close to an issue, you don't have that out with geomancy. With geomancy, it's extremely blunt. It does give you that information, that answer up front. If you proceed with this course of action, here are how things will play out. And that is where I find geomancy extremely useful. I started to follow um, Sam Block and Dr. Al Cummings, their work, and I was following Sam Block's Digital Ambler and some things that I learned from Dr. Al. And I want to undertake any kind of ritual work sans uh, geomantic divination to know, A, is this the right course of action for me to do? And B, how will this play out in my favor? And if those two things are not going to play out, well, then I'm not going to do the ritual, you know, irrespective of, you know, how I think or what I think I should do. Because geomancy will give you that answer up front and let you know how things will play out. So for ceremonial magic, it's extremely useful. Yeah, I was... Uh just the last few weeks uh, doing some teaching on how to use tarot, of course, to narrow down your approach to a ritual, because obviously it can help you tweak your approach, uh, reshape the sort of uh, tools that you're going to use. You know what I mean? Uh, just come at the same thing from a different angle or with a different concept. And then the tarot can help you guide that approach. But definitely geomancy is uh, a bit more cut and dry and less open to, uh, intuitive interpretation it seems exactly it does not give you the out i think sometimes that tarot does and i'm again i'm only speaking of myself i mean i'm an aquarian i can talk myself into any amount of scenarios <laughs> um that's I, that's a particularly aquarian quality geomancy will provide yeah you, you don't have to tell me that brother <laughs> aquarians united Right. Um, so I, you know, if I had to describe myself, I'm a materialist first, first and foremost. I believe in the things that I can touch. I believe in the things that I can have. And that is my, first and foremost, my belief in material things. And if that's your approach to magic, to materially gain things, then I would recommend geomancy. And that's not a pitch for like going to buy something from me. I really could care less there. I think there's maybe a handful, like two, 300 people at most within the United States that do geomancy. So it's like, you know, there's very few people that, 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 that practice this. So I, but I think if you do believe in material needs and that is your approach to magic or that is your, where you're coming to this thing from, then I can recommend geomancy. I mean, and take it from me, um, someone who immigrated to the United States, I don't, I'm an orphan. I don't have like both my parents are deceased. I'm pretty much, I moved here on my own and had to make a life for myself. And geomancy, magic, divination, those are all tools that I used 
in the search for material things. That's been purely my approach to all of this. And I'm not saying other approaches are wrong or not right or anything of that sort. So please don't take it that way. Oh, I'm, I'm sure no one will. Well, uh, maybe a few people. I, I always notice the people who, uh, uh, you know, shit on res results-based magic, which arguably is all magic, um, arguably. Um, you tend to be people who have never needed much in life. You know what I mean? Yeah, I mean, I can I can tell you a little bit about my own happenstances. So oh, you don't... Do. Yeah, you don't move from a country like the one I was living in, which we had a fairly comfortable middle class life and you move to America and you've got to start everything out from scratch. And America, um, you know, it's, it's a great country to live in. There are a lot of opportunities. However, there are also a lot of things that can happen to somebody, um, you know, like crime is, yep. is an issue. Uh, gun violence is fairly prominent so there there are a lot of things that can happen and i'm one of those people that has always looked on why am i doing any of this why am i buying the tools why am i reading the books why am i practicing the rituals why am i doing any of this because let's face it it's a lot of money to spend on something and there are no lodges out over here in the Midwest that you could join and be in fellowship with other practitioners. If you're doing this out in the Midwest, you are on your own. And it's a lot of money to spend on something. And I've always tended to look at these things as an investment. How can I justify my investment in the tools? What are my results? And, you know, in, in all of those things, I can give you some examples. Um, Prior to buying the house that I lived in, I did a geomantic reading to know, is this the place for me? I, I also read for other people, although that's not my full-time occupation. Um, you know, and I also, as part of just the ethics of being a reader, I check back with people two months after every reading to find out, did I get things right or did I get them wrong? Because I want to know. I record the planetary hours. I record the rituals. I record the all measure of, of ephemera of when I did that particular reading and what things I did for that reading. Was there, uh, was there an invocation involved or something like that? Or was it just straight computational geomancy? And in about the time period that I've been reading for people, whenever I check back with them, the time period when I've gotten things wrong and this is only when I felt comfortable enough doing it for myself that I started to offer it to other people as a, as a service. The only time I've gotten things wrong was when I didn't tell people explicitly what the reading was telling me. Either for, uh. you know, you're, you're afraid that you're going to tell somebody something and they won't take it really well. So you kind of temper what you're going to tell them. Because telling people news or giving them a reading, especially, if it's not good, is also in how you say it is, is as important as what you say. So then that's primarily where, you know, the early, early period when I started to give people readings is when I started to, you know, notice, okay, there were some discrepancies. But after that initial period of me getting the fear out of the way of like how I say things to people and becoming more adept at breaking news, I checked back with everyone two months later, and the readings are fairly accurate. Uh, and, you know, I would encourage everyone to explore it for themselves and to, you know, check on their own results. Yeah, that's a very cool that you, you do that and check back in and, and are curious about your own, your own reading. Maybe we'll have to do one sometime. I've actually never had anyone do a geomancy for me before. That could be a lot of fun. Um, yeah, I actually gave Taylor Elwood um he's a practitioner yeah i know that guy yeah i gave him a reading and he he reviewed one of my readings where he talks about geomancy and i did a reading for him too and it, you know he he did like a a, a video on how accurate it was so cool. and, and i encourage everyone to you know explore it for themselves the other part about why i think geomancy has a lot of efficacy now i can tell you a little bit about pakistan and how it's used over there Oh, yeah, please do. 
Yeah, so for example, um, I was in the port city of Karachi. Uh, I've been to Pakistan many times. I've got really good uh, close friends from growing up that live in Pakistan. And in, Pakistan has a very rich history of geomancy. Um, basically, uh, I guess what you could, India, when it was just one country, um, it was majority Hindu and I think like minority Muslim. And during the partition, when the British pulled out post-World War II, you have the country partition into uh, majority um, Hindu India. And then basically uh, Pakistan, which was majority Muslim. And the British split the country up. And uh, prior to that, there is a lot of... Um, Muslim forms of mysticism that were transmitted directly from the Middle East that maybe are no longer the sources are available that were transmitted to, you know, in Pakistan or to that Muslim population over there. So there's a lot of geomancy. There's a lot of um, Islamic forms of mysticism and magic that are prominent. And um, anyway, so... And around the 2000, I was in Pakistan. And for people who don't know this, um, during an election season in, in Karachi, it can be, which is the port city, uh, the main city of Pakistan. It's, uh, it's a kind of like New York. It's a main hub. There's a lot of trading. It's a port city. It can also be around election time, a spectacularly violent place to live. And during election season, there's uh, almost like a tradition of violence that goes back around election season with different political parties employing, um, I guess you could call them assassins, to bump people off or to plant bombs or to Jesus. terrorize you know, the other side's voting uh, places and things like that. So in that climate, there are people that use geomancy. There are politicians. There are even the people that do the assassinations themselves uh, use geomancy. They go to <laughs> like, the geomantic yeah. assassin. We just wrote our new Hollywood film. No, I'm telling you, it it sounds it sounds. I I, I acknowledge how this must sound to a lot of Westerners, but out there. It's considered a legitimate form. I mean, what else are you going to rely on to know if you're going to do this thing and how it will play out? I mean, you're living in a city with a lot of poverty, vast gulf between the haves and the have-nots. And, you know, it's like I said, it's a violent place because around political season, people are fighting for all manner of things. There's... Um, there's a really good article you can read called Gangs of Karachi that details some of the gang violence that takes place. There are actually entire city blocks of Karachi that are taken over literally by certain gangs that they run the power, they run the water, you know, all of that. But anyway, I digress. So in that environment, you actually have people that go to a geomancer that will ask, okay, you know, how will this play out in my favor? You know, will I, should I take this job? should I not do it or and wow. you can, yeah you can even find out um, some of these things because for example in Pakistan a charge of using sorcery especially I was going to ask is it legal no 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 that's ah. the thing it is absolutely illegal it is uh, a charge of sorcery can cost you your life I kid you not about that even mm -hmm. in the Middle East you know, as kids, I, I this is going to sound horrible, but as children growing up in North Vancouver, uh, the, we talked about Pakistan a lot, but only in one context. If one of the kids would like throw something on the ground or drop gum on the ground or litter, the other kids would be like, in Pakistan, they'd beat you with a cane if you did that. Ha ha ha. And that was it. But we said it all the time. Anytime someone littered, isn't it? It's kind of messed up, I know. But like that was literally all we knew about Pakistan. Yeah, I mean, it's it's a country with vast disparities. So, for example, when I lived over there, I lived with friends that we lived in a wall compound 
the part of uh, Karachi we lived in was called Defense Phase One. You know, you're with um, your neighbors are the, uh, I guess you could call them the judiciary or politicians or their extended family or army officers. But once you leave out and you go into, I guess, just the general city itself, you can see these disparities at work. They are fairly obvious between where you live and just how other people live. So in that, in that environment, given those disparities and given you know, the violence and so on and so forth, people, like I said, they rely on, well, what can I use to get ahead? And for a lot of people, they have, I think people in the West, they think of magic as something associated with the losers of society. You don't have the means to get ahead Ergo, you're, you're trying to fall back on superstition. In other parts of the world, that's not the belief. It's associated with people that have the means to learn, people that have the means to practice, and then to also um, either sell their skill or to show it to somebody or something like that. So in that context, if you are an effective geomancer and you can get good results for people, you need not fear a charge of sorcery. Business will come to you. It's illicit, yes, 110% it's illicit. Can it get you killed? Yes, again, because it is an illicit activity. However, if you're effective, you will have people covering you. If you know, you're giving people bad advice or you tell them a wrong answer or things don't go you know, well in the person who you were advising, in those instances, you can expect someone to, you know, publicly claim that this man is doing sorcery. And in such cases, you know, it can be quite bad for you. Even in the Middle East, I've lived in Saudi Arabia and I have been to a lot of, a lot of other parts of the Middle East. And a charge of sorcery, especially if it was used to hurt somebody or if that's the accusation, it can go quite badly for you. That's not an idle threat. Yeah, it makes me think of, you know, when when uh, early Christianity, early Roman Christianity outlawed magic. It's it's, you know, most people assume it's because they thought it was uh, either just because it was heretical or because it was nonsense. But in fact, it was because they believed it was, you know, so effective they had to get it out of the hands of those who would use it. What's the reason why it's illegal in Pakistan, for example? Is it because they want to, you know, because uh, it's superstitious? Or what's the, do you have any, any idea? No, I mean, a lot of it goes back to Islamic law and, you know, practicing any form of sorcery is, okay. you know, those things can, being against Islamic law. Okay, yeah. Those things can, like I said, uh, earn you a pretty stiff punishment. In Saudi Arabia, they, you can, and don't believe me, you can, you know, if you have the stomach for it, there are videos of them persecuting a lot of people, um, specifically on charges of sorcery. Uh, even, in, even in Egypt, for example, you know, if someone accuses you, then it can be quite bad for you. Uh, albeit in, in a place like Cairo, there are, you know, fewer people that would, actually you know maybe accuse somebody but in a in a place like pakistan i mean that's you know with those vast disparities you also find justice to be rough and brutal and quick so in those instances um you know obviously if you're not really good as a geomancer you're not in business very long i you know i don't know what to say if you're someone who's really good obviously and you have results that you can give people like people can accuse you of any amount of things. They can say that this guy, you know, he did X, Y, and Z, you know, they can throw you in prison. You'll get out tomorrow. There will be very powerful people who will cover for you. And, you know, and I, the thing that always- Is it be, in- because they value your skill level? Yes, yes, because they value your skill level. I mean, wow. you, gotta, you gotta imagine in the city with like, where violence is rampant, uh, especially around election season, you know, and really powerful people are coming to you for a reading or something like that, you know, you got to imagine that if you give them good advice and they survive an election season, 
or someone tries to get them and they missed, they're attributing that directly to your counsel as a geomancer, in which case they're going to want to keep you around. They're going to want to ask you more questions. <laughs> How can I so magicians are sorcery is illegal and can get you executed unless you're really good at it. Then you're just too valuable to kill. It's just like in anything. Well, yeah. not to the, the extremities, you know, notwithstanding, it's like anything else. If you're effective, you're in business. If you're not, you know, then you're just not. It's so apropos of, of my reading of uh, Everyday Magicians this week. I, I, I grabbed one of the, uh, you know, the Penn State books. It's the first Penn State magic series book I've actually read, which is a, a shameful thing for me to admit. But it's the legal records and magic manuscripts from Tudor England and the case studies, uh, you know, them, you know. And it, so the cunning men, the cunning folk were very well respected. And there was never any crossover, apparently, of trials of cunning people and trials of witches and witchcraft. Those two things actually weren't confused, which I'm sure is shocking to most people. It was to even my buddy who's, uh, you know, did his master's in, in, in history and specialized in this stuff. You know, he was very surprised to hear that. But it's one of the great things about the academic study of, of magic and esotericism that's going on these days. Is we're, we're learning these sort of details that are very informative and and to realize that there was, you know, that there wasn't always this conflation of respected, learned, cunning folk, you know, use it as a general term for sorcerers if you want, versus, you know, malefic, diabolical witchcraft, which was usually a charge levied at people who actually didn't know anything about magic whatsoever, in the legal records, at least, of Tudor England. So it's quite a parallel to what you're talking about, it seems to me. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I, you know, like like I stated, um, I think it's it's like anything else. If you're really effective and you have the patronage of really important people, I mean, you've got to remember even Dr. John D. You know, he had patronage. You know, and if you are effective at what you do and you have the patronage of powerful people, um, at that point you can expect that obviously you do have a certain amount of um, immunity or you know you can get away with certain things whereas if you were perhaps not as effective at what you were doing then you know someone levied a charge against you because they believed that they paid you and you swindled them then like i said it could go it could go any number of ways for you and none of them none of them good yeah that was what was interesting to me about this uh, everyday magicians and in, in tudor england like the cunning folk who were charged with magical crimes it wasn't usually because of the magic. It was because of what they were using it for, like treason or swindling or, uh, or you know, or causing a disturbance. Like you, they weren't, it wasn't a problem that they were magicians. They were, the, the fact that they were actually cunning folk is what often helped them in the, in the problem uh, rather than hindered them. That wasn't the problem. It was that they were maybe being accused of stuff causing a disturbance or, or, or you know, doing other bad things so i've been reading that while i've had the flu all week as you know actually i still have the flu eh? i'm uh, hopped up on all kinds of medication which is why i i i was uh, happy when you mentioned you didn't want to do a video interview because i was like cool we'll go old old school audio only and that also means we can do this without me needing to look all pristine on camera like i normally do of course just a Dionysian object of visual beauty and we can focus more on the the chit chat so this is really nice no uh, ditto hmm? oh I said ditto thank no, you ditto. Guys. I appreciate you having me on I you know I'm thankful thankful to be over here yeah well it's very cool I'm, I'm learning a lot and and to, to see the even just the parallels of of how society has treated uh magicians and sorcerers and cunning folk then versus now in some parts of the world is really fascinating because I am sure most people aren't aware of everything we've just talked about regarding sorcery in in the Middle East and and these countries, right? I don't think most people know this. I mean, they're probably not surprised that you can get in trouble for doing sorcery and witchcraft. I mean, that's not surprising, but but it's uh, I I don't think most people realize that it's considered a, a useful and valuable and real thing you know no it totally is um i can even tell you some anecdotes like from oman 
Oh, please do. Please do. So like from Oman, there's very often people that do practice magic, at least in an Islamic context. There is always going to be a way that they try to disguise, I guess, what they're doing as like theurging. So, for example, um, it's not magic; it's theurgy. I swear. <laughs> <laughs> What's theurgy? Oh, well, I'm summoning Hecate. That's not magic. <laughs> nope. Nope. <laughs> Sorry. So, for example, um, you, you do have like a lot of people that are considered like, I guess. You could call them like holy men. And one of the things that they do make for people is like um, like a Muslim talisman called a ba'awiz, which is like um, certain prayers, they're written and then they're folded. And then they basically, they bless these little prayers. They really fold them, they write them and fold them into these really minute kind of um, pieces of paper. And then they tie it up into like uh, a leather pouch and you're supposed to wear this some people they even they if they make it small enough they will drink it or they will swallow it um but more often than not that is perhaps a bit more old school but most people they will tie that around their neck or they'll tie it around their waist or something like a leather pouch with this little uh, prayer that's in it but i mean that's no different from making a magical talisman you know, some of these, they have like Islamic magic squares on them, you know, and oh. of course, if you ask these guys, what are you doing? They're going to tell you, no, no, no. What I'm doing is 110%. It's within like the bounds of Islam and it's theurgy. And I'm trying to help this person get over an illness or I'm trying to help them with, you know, attracting better luck or something like that. You know, so they, they are, there is that overlap where people they do do these things but obviously they try and disguise what they're doing to make it more amenable they try to do it in an islamic context to and they're most of the time they're largely shias in the shia community although not exclusively there are a fair amount of sunnis also but the tradition of like islamic mysticism is more prominent in the shia community which you can think of the shias as more like Catholics, and you can think of the Sunnis as more like Protestants, if that if that uh, analogy makes sense. And I'm I, and I hope you don't think I'm trying to simplify it. I'm just giving people an analogy to allow them to conceptualize the the two different branches and how they approach things. Because uh, most of the Shia community, they are, I believe, is, especially Ismailis, for example, they are more attuned or have more knowledge of this kind of thing or this kind of art or there are more people in these communities that have practitioners that do do these kind of things yeah yeah no that that's interesting i i do know a bit about a little bit about that so i've been i've been in love with a turkish girl and a kurdish girl not at the same time um so i have some understanding of the different denominations as you might call it within islam um, but I don't know much about the magical traditions within them. Even though I was trained, my first teacher was a was an Arabic adept, uh, Nineveh Shadrach. He, he's the one who gave me the motto for RC, like Rumpens Katane. And uh, so I have some familiarity with that stuff, but I would love to learn more about uh, uh, yeah, yeah. The magic within the different Islamic Denom, uh, denom you don't call them denominations do you no you can just say like i guess sex maybe perhaps is like the better term cool or yeah or maybe even denomination i suppose it i although i've never heard that used but i don't think it would be uh, incorrect use of the, the term but yeah there there is that tradition and you know that people do try to disguise what they what they do and you know frame it in a different context so that it seems more amenable to a lot of people's minds where it, it doesn't arouse as much suspicion or something like that. So, yeah. That's how I got away with a lot of stuff when I was in seminary and a priest in training at St. Augustine's um, was by, you know, I would, I would lead, you know, classes and workshops and stuff. 
in which I would involve uh, Kabbalah, but I would just say it's, you know, this is Jewish mysticism and, and no one wanted to, no one would ever question that because they wanted to be very inclusive and not disrespectful to the Jewish tradition, um, especially in the liberal uh, Christian world. There's a lot of concern for not uh, disrespecting Judaism any more than we already have you know, calling it the Old Testament and, and stuff like that, right? So as long yeah. as I said, oh, this is a Jewish mystical practice, it was like, oh, wow, you know, this is okay, okay. Now visualize these letters <laughs> and you could get away with it, right? Um, and no one knew what the word Kabbalah was back then because it was prima donna uh, days. So, you know, you know, if I had said Kabbalah, no one would have known the word anyway at all. You know, well, right. teach, professors would have, but, they, you know, they they sort of knew what I was up to, but they didn't care because... They didn't believe magic is real or so, somehow, somehow. I don't know how prayer can be real, but magic can be. No, absolutely. Um, so we were talking about, um, you know, why would anyone take up geomancy or what is the efficacy? And this is another aspect of geomancy that I think is very underexplored among a lot of practitioners. Uh, so, for example, most people, when they learn geomancy, uh, I'm not sure about how it's thought in the Golden Dawn, but there is a strictly computational approach where, you know, you just throw down the four mothers, then you go ahead and you do the daughters and so on and so forth, left witness, right witness, and then you have your judge, and then you have your reconciler and so on. Yep, exactly like that. Uh, we usually did the marks on a piece of paper, though, not a not not sand and boxes. I wish they had had us make those boxes with sand. I think a lot more people would get into it if if we had all had to make boxes, sort of like the beautiful one described in Skinner's Techniques of High Magic. Um, but instead, you know, they just have you do it on paper, and so there's not as much of a, a tactile investment into the practice, unfortunately. Oh yeah, yeah absolutely. Um, I. Th for me, at least, using the Kira style dice, one of the advantages is if you're doing a reading for somebody face to face. Okay, and a lot of times I'm either doing the readings on Zoom or sometimes I'll go to a coffee shop and I'll talk with somebody and, you know, we could do a reading at a coffee shop or so on, or we're meeting outdoors in a park or something like that and I'm giving somebody a reading. One of the advantages of doing uh, a reading with the Kira style dice is when you drop them down with both dice, you already have the four mothers. So you know the, the pattern that's being cohered. It's readily visible to you. And you can do that while you're already mentally, you're computing, you know, the daughters and, you know, you're, you're dotting all of the stuff down on a chart. So anyway, that, that's kind of one of the advantages um, to using Kira um, I've never used a box myself, although I can imagine with sand, it would also be very tactile, you know, so that tactile experience might be something that people do like. So as I was saying, one of the aspects from computational, there's that. And then there's also more, I guess you could say the invocational aspects of geomancy. Like, for example, John Hayden has given us the spirit sigils for the seven planetary spirits. And those are the spirits that I have carved on to that brass plate, the calling plate that I use. And you can even use that, those spirits, and call them into a reading. You're I talking mean, about the Olympic, right? No. No, no. Those, no. Those are completely different. Right. You're talking about uh, what, like spirits like Zazel? Yes, Zazel. Yes. That's right. Sorry, I do. I, my, I'm a little foggy because of the flu and all the codeine, but and <laughs> all the stuff I'm on. Right, right. Okay, not the Olympics. I don't know. That's what I was just listening to the new Frater Acker interview. That's why I had Olympics on the brain. Um, right. Zazel, the spirits. Sorry, continue. No, you're I'll completely shut up. <laughs> No, no, you're completely fine. Look, I'm not going to tell you that I haven't flubbed things before because I'd be lying through my teeth. Everyone has a flub here and there. So you're going to call in one of those spirits, depending on the nature of the question. So, for example, for love readings, if you go ahead and you call Kedmil into a reading, you will notice a difference 
if you draw that sigil down, if you invoke that spirit, if you call that spirit into a reading, you will notice a, a different, a highly attuned form of reading kind of takes over you. As a geomancer, that you tend to notice symmetries or things on a chart that you would normally maybe make associations with just computationally. But again, computational has a certain aspect, okay, A leads to B leads to C, and that's the pattern. But when you do the spirit invocation part of the reading, and I don't do that for every reading, obviously, but on readings that call for that particular aspect of it, uh, that sense of highly evolved sense of intuition when it comes over a geomancer, I think that that is a spiritual practice that any ceremonial magician can use. That is, I think, where when you spend time meditating on the figures, when you spend time doing a lot of readings, when you look back, on, I encourage every geomancer to keep a book to date every reading you did, to check back with people, whether you invoke spirits or not during the reading and so on, thereby you have a good idea of what works and what doesn't when you're looking back on a year's worth of readings and what your results were. Like you have to be ruthlessly honest with yourself. I mean, I don't know any other way you can do that and be a, a diviner. You know, you have to be honest and ruthful a ruthless rather with yourself and judge yourself, you know, um, on what your results were. If you do that and you do do a spirit invocation for readings, you will notice the difference. I don't, I don't recommend doing this on your first reading, on your second reading, on your third reading. You're not going to get the results you're looking for. I would say if you're a seasoned reader, you've been doing this at least six to seven months, maybe a year at most, you will, if you do that practice and call some of those spirits into a reading to point out things in a chart that you might miss as a geomancer or you might not make an association, you will notice that sense of evolved intuition take over you where you're able to notice things on the chart that previously you may not have noticed. It's like someone sitting on your shoulder and saying, oh, look over here, have you thought about this? Or look over there, like that's the thing that may, you know, may happen for that person. And that does take over a geomancer when you do that practice. A ceremonial magician can always use that as a skill, especially in this day and age that we live in. So how often would you say, do you, when you do a geomancy reading with the spirit invocation involved, do you ever ask for clarifications or commune directly with the spirit? Is that what you're talking about? With my own self, it's never been like something talking to me. It's been more like something telling me. Talking would imply a two-way contact. Like I say something sure. back and I get a response. But when I'm calling the spirit into a reading, it's for a very specific purpose. All of my invocations say point out things on the chart that I cannot see. Because from a computational aspect, I know the things that I know. I know the things that I can visibly observe on a chart and how these geomantic figures, how they relate to one another. With a spirit in the reading, I'm calling that spirit into the reading to tell me things about the chart that I am not able to see, just from a computational aspect. And that, where you would apply that, at least for me in my own readings, is on really tougher questions that I would get from some people. Mm. Uh, let's say it's a very tenuous um, financial situation for somebody, and they want to know that, you know, will this financial decision or not, will this thing, you know, if I take this job and I leave the one that, you know, let's say, as a situation that someone asked me about, you know, I, this job that I'm working, I make a lot of money, but I'm really unhappy doing this. If I take this other job, is this company stable? 
well, I have a job if I leave the secure one and take this, this new position? Is that something, you know, how will that play out? You know, and questions like that, you know, that would be like a harder question that I would want another set of eyes. I would want to know more things about the chart other than just what I am able to see. So right. questions like that, or if they're like harder relationship questions, you know, in situations like that, I don't want to go into specifics because of what people tell me, but certain relationship questions where, you know, it's obviously it's a tough choice for somebody. And I always make sure to give them, you know, my disclaimer, like these are just things that I'm telling you. I always let people know that with geomancy, if the person I'm giving a reading to, if they have agency, you can take a bad hand and turn it around into a good one because you know what's coming down the pipeline. You have that foreknowledge. With a lack of agency, someone can take even a very good reading and fail to capitalize on the opportunities that the reading is presenting to them, and you could turn a winning hand into a losing one. Hmm. Wow. That's interesting. Yeah. So, so de definitely the spirit does bring revelation through mystical dialogue, as I would say it. Um, but by bringing the spirit involved, it shows you things within the reading that your analytical mind might miss, correct? It's not really that your analytical mind will miss. It's more like the situation that they're asking for. Mm. You get to understand nuances about that situation or probabilities about that situation that are not just purely computational. You get to notice the computational aspect is fairly straightforward. How that fits in with the question that they're asking, you get other intuition to ask about, hey, have you done this? Or, oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, exactly. You, But wait, you didn't tell me that in the question. You see what I mean? So you get additional information from a chart. The computational aspects and how those pertain to the reading, if you're a good enough geomancer, let's say you've been doing this for about a year or two years, three years, however, those things you already know, those things you're already understanding. But to know the things that you don't know from looking at the chart, that's what the spirit will reveal to you for that particular um, question that you're getting from a querent. That's where a spirit invocation can be particularly in my experience, particularly useful. When I was making that plate of the seven planets, I also um, included, I've put a circle around all of those spirit sigils. And within the circle, I've put four names for God from a larger Islamic corpus of 99 names. These are names that I've seen geomancers use Geomancers also use prayers to open up their reading, and they use prayers to close down their reading, at least in Oman from my observation. And some of the prayers and the names, the holy names that pe people they use in the Middle East, those are the names that I've put um, smack in the center of the circle, um, and all of the spirit sigils ringing that with a circle around them. That's generally the thing that I have found to be the most effective in an invocation, at least for my own practice. So those names around um, in the center of the plate, they read the knower of all, the seer of all, the judge and the witness. Those are like part of the 99 names, beautiful names of Allah, so, subhanahu wa ta'ala. So those like names are the ones that I put in the middle of the plate. So yeah, that's generally what I can tell people from just my own experience as uh, a reader. That's that's very yeah, very interesting. Um, and you're going to get me back into geomancy, aren't you? Yeah, I mean, like I not only that. If you follow a lot of um, Dr. Al Cummings' work, when you're let's say you're trying to do um, a planetary invocation, okay. Mm -hmm. you're going to work with a particular planet and you're seeing okay well jupiter and pisces not retrograde not combust you know position of the moon is good 
X, Y, and Z. Okay, I have all of these things as a factor, and I'm going to go off and do this this particular rite with Jupiter, for example. With the geomantic sigils and the geomantic characters and the elemental and astrological um, qualities of these geomantic figures and their geomantic sigils, you already have that astrological virtue of the planet in those figures. They're already imbued with that particular energy. Uh, I hate to use the term energy, but it sounds very new agey, but you know what I mean. It's actually a fine word, I think, you know. Right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. People Having, know. yeah, because those figures in geomancy and those geomantic sigils, they already have that planetary virtue in them. You are not reliant on what the astral weather is at the time. You're not reliant on this particular conjunction or this particular thing or that particular thing, you know, you're not waiting, looking for an opportune moment to go off and do that particular work, you know, so that that is an added advantage that geomancy does have, you know, you're not reliant on, on uh, astrological factors to go off and do some geomantic ritual work, you know, so when I was looking for a divination system, like a lot of people, I, you know, I was a card reader. I think most people that practice magic start off that way. And from over there, I wanted to learn something else. And when I discovered Stephen Skinner, Paul Hewson, they're both talking about geomancy. I'm in the Middle East. I'm reading this. I'm looking at people doing geomancy. And I'm like, okay, these guys are talking about it. You know, they might be onto something. That's amazing. <laughs> wow. Yeah, I, it sounds ironic. That I only put credence in it after reading it in, in a book by, you know, uh, an Australian author. But nevertheless, I, I think that geomantic magic, and if people follow Dr. Al Cummings' work, who I would consider myself a student of his, I think that they can discover that there is a lot of efficacy in geomancy and, by extension, geomantic magic. Yeah, I'm keen to learn more. Actually, one of the reasons you're on the podcast, though, don't take this the wrong way, is because he he doesn't re didn't reply to my emails. Okay, uh, yeah, I tried I... to get him on the podcast for like the last two weeks, and but didn't even get a reply. And I was like, and then I, uh, you know, and then I messaged you. I was going to message you anyway, but you know what I'm saying. I was curious to like dig into this a bit more and get get it some of geomancy stuff on the podcast and. Uh, He's a, he's a hard cat to get, though he probably just gets way too many emails and probably didn't even see them, of course, right? But anyway, I'm very stoked that uh, that you're the one I'm talking to because, uh, yeah, this is so appropriate given your uh, your Kickstarter and these fabulous uh, dice you've created. Can I ask you something about the dice? Um, uh, Denny on Foolish Fish YouTube, of course, he mentions uh, mentioned a question basically uh, about the dice, sort of he, he, pon he pondered about the fact that you don't see all the sides or something like that. I don't quite remember how he said it. He was like, but I wonder how this works with these form of geomantic dice, given that you, you know, some of the sides are covered up. Um, so I'm not really sure what question um, is probably just the angle. Yeah. But I think he wasn't sides... aware that, that this is a traditional form of, of, of geomancy, the dice being used this way in on the stick. Uh, what what's it called again? Kira. Kira. Yeah. Yeah. So so obviously, since they're on uh, the stick, uh, pardon my feeble descriptions of them, um, doesn't do them justice. Some obviously, the top and bottom side are covered by the dice above and below. So, but that doesn't affect or diminish using the kira over another method right no not at all so okay example, okay i think um, he was wondering if it did uh he just sort of touched on it briefly i i barely noticed it but i caught it in my mind i was like okay remember to ask uh ask the fellow that oh uh, no not at all so like when you're when you're rolling the dice you have them in your palms you'll roll them and then drop them down and whatever side of the dice is face up uh, given that there's two rows of four dice and the indents on them will spell out the first four mothers. 
in totality. So um, yeah, all, each side of the dice basically all have indents on them and dropping both of those, both uh, or dropping one Kira set down after a roll will give you all four mothers. So that way you can see everything. So it's whatever side is facing upwards, no different from any D&D dice or, or any other type of dice, whatever side is up, that's the side that you're reading. Yeah. Yeah, and it doesn't bias the dice to one fig uh, certain figures over others because because just because not all six sides are used, right? No, 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 yeah. they are not. It doesn't bias the 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 reading or the which figures show up. Speaking of figures, I mean, I had to you know memorize the shapes and of course all the Latin names for them, but given their Arabic origin, they must have Arabic names, correct? Yeah, they do have Arabic names, and and those names are those the original names? They must be. No, I'll be completely honest. Uh, my knowledge of geomancy doesn't go that far back to mm. discern the actual um, names or historically how they were called and so on. I mean, that's, I do that's know in the Skinner book, as we were discussing off air. Yeah, I mean, like, no, and even their practitioners, even in Sam Block's uh, Geomantic Study Group, uh, which is a Facebook group, which if anyone's listening and you really want to learn about geomancy or you just want to be in fellowship with other practitioners and just gain some reading skills or even just have other people look at a chart that you cast and get their takes on it, it's like an absolute wonderful resource. Or even Sam Block's blog, the Digital Ambler, I utilized that for many years. That's an amazing, amazing resource. Yeah, I was uh, wondering who he was, I, but I I know Digital Ambler. I didn't know who Sam Block was, but that's cool. Okay, yeah, Digital Ambler's great, Sam. Uh, so shout out to that Facebook group. Yeah, absolutely. Um, the 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 Facebook group is absolutely amazing. There are readers from all over the world. There are readers from geomancers from Nigeria. There are ones from Iran. There's um, many other parts of Africa that also do practice geomancy. You find like a wide variety of people in those groups. And there's one or two practitioners that are very knowledgeable about the history and how it's practiced in their own individual countries and so on. So it's it's a really great resource. And then Sam, Sam Block's blog, The Digital Ambler, is also really amazing. Um, it's a free resource. If anyone wants to learn more about the figures, the meditations. Also, um, I've been reading for quite a while my own self. And I took Dr. Al Cummings' Geomancy Foundations course. And even for a re reader like myself who's been doing it for a while, I can highly recommend that. And I'm not trying to pitch it to anybody or anything like that. I'm just saying if you have an interest in geomancy and you want to learn from a master geomancer, uh, as doc I consulted Dr. Al on my own project. I'll just be forthcoming. And um, if I'll anyone... pitch it. Take his course, people. You're not going to learn it from me. <laughs> yeah, like he, Dr. Al's work is absolutely amazing. His foundation yeah, he's awesome. is, you know, second, it's probably one of the best courses I've ever taken. And even if you're a really proficient reader, you can get a lot out of his course. I can't recommend it enough. So, yeah. Awesome. Awesome. So, um, do we have more to say on Jamancy? Yeah. Because um, there's a few so, other things I'd like to talk to you about as well. I don't want to spend yeah, the whole time on geomancy, but but I also don't want to move on too soon, you know? No, no, you're absolutely... Okay, if I could just finish, uh, if I could just give a, a final pitch, I oh, guess, and then yeah, move go for it. So, like, you know, you being in the Golden Dawn and... Well, I was 20 years ago. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Uh, if there are ceremonial magicians that also, you know, believe in... If the, I, I guess in a lot of things you have to ask yourself, why am I doing this? And why is this the practice for right now? Why I believe geomancy is a 
particularly effective oracle for right now is in my experience, geomancy deals best with the things that people need. All the needs that people have while they're here, like their material needs, their primarily material, I, you, although you can use it for other things also. Most of the questions that I get from people pertain to their material needs or, you know, and fewer questions, you know, for people's emotional needs. But I really think that geomancy being a divination practice for right now because it deals with material needs. We've come out of a pandemic in the United States that has killed upwards of a million people. A lot of really good people that I know are hurting. They were injured, either their businesses by the pandemic or they've fallen ill with long COVID or a variety of issues. And, you know, aside from even that, there is still, it's ongoing and there are quite a lot of people that are dealing with just some fairly hard economic happenstances. And my approach to divination has always been maximize gain, minimize loss. When I was doing this for myself, I noticed the results in my own life, which is why I, for me, divination and magic, I have to be able to show a return on those things. This is just my belief. It's, if it's nobody else's, that's also fine. I have to be able to justify the amount of resources I spend on these things versus what I'm getting in return. And when I notice the efficacy in dealing and navigating with things in America and my own life, um, after taking up geomancy and making decisions and charting out paths using this practice, this oracle, if you will, I believe in its efficacy. And if you're a ceremonial magician, given if you're in America, I don't know about other places, but this is a very hot country to live in. It's not particularly easy to find your footing. And divination does go a long way to finding out, to know the things that you do not know, that you do not know. It goes a long way to helping you move in certain directions that you may not have thought you needed to move to. So, you know, but try it for yourself. And it includes spirit invocation. It includes aspects of magic also. Uh, there are the geomantic sigils that you can also use to have a lot of planetary virtue. All of those aspects, if that doesn't fit neatly into a practice of ceremonial magic, I, I don't know what will. So, yeah, that's my final pitch. Wonderful. Yeah, the uh, it moves us great into sort of the next uh, thing I'd like to talk about, but keeps it with us, the the, the reasons for doing magic and, and, and the, the results-based issue versus sort of spiritual growth and spiritual alchemy, um, as, as is controversially debated these days. Um, people, I think a lot of people have a very hard time. I, 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 I have people say to me, like people I respect, I have people, I, magicians I highly respect who say to me, you know, doing magic to get things in this world is, is, is sinful and, uh, and uh, disgusting and just bad. And I have magicians I respect say, if you're not doing magic to improve the quality of your life and, and bring abundance to you and those around you, what the fuck are you doing? You know? Yeah, respectfully. Pardon my French. No, you're fine. I, you know, respectfully, I can. You I can already got us a COVID warning on this episode, so we may as well, like, no holds barred. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I can I can only tell you about my own approach, right? And yeah. my own friend who's a member of the Golden Dawn, he believes in the alchemy of transforming, you know, the base matter of like the human being and all of the human wants and so on and so forth. And that's fine. That's That's an approach for some people. That's not been my approach. And I respect people who do that also. They are far nobler souls than I am. In this world, I believe in the things that I can grasp and the things that bring me material goods uh, because we all need to eat, we all need to sleep, we need a roof over our heads, we need to pay our bills and, you know, your cat needs cat food and so on and so forth. And 
how do you justify then what you're doing, the expense you spend on books, um, the amount of time that you spend in these things? If I was not able to show an effect from um, or an improvement in my material well-being from the things that I learned, believe it or not, I would have gone and taken up accounting. You know, that would have been my chosen path in life. Okay, you know, maybe I should go and become a CPA or something like that, you know? But exactly, exactly. Uh, I was thinking of, it makes me think of Fred Ocker who mentions uh, that he's never found magic to have any, uh, How do, I can't quote him exactly, unfortunately, but he's never found that magic was a very useful in gaining material things like money and et cetera, and that it was easier just to get those things directly in the world through regular means and that magic was for something else, um, which, you know, and I have no problem with that position at all, but I don't find that, to, I don't, I, that hasn't been my experience and I'm not experienced, uh, I'm an experienced like money magician at all. There's lots of better people to talk to about that stuff. Like, Clifford Lowe probably and tons of others but however I can definitely say the few times I've done it it works and uh and using magic to improve the quality of your life I think is is uh isn't that a bad is it, it to, to me it's, it reminds me of the line you know that you know in Paul that Christ came for us to have life abundant you know so there's this dual dual theology of giving up your life to find your true life. And but then there's this also this idea of finding your true life should bring abundance to you in the here and now in the incarnated world. Makes me think of the Kabbalists who say that, you know, all prayer goes up and comes down like the angels going up and down Jacob's ladder. Yeah, I mean, that's that's completely fine. And. There are those two approaches, and you know, Fatah Akar is right. You know, it's uh, are there more direct ways? Absolutely. I I think that's the difference in magic and magical thinking. And for a magician, I think that that is a key thing to always know the difference between magic and magical thinking. It's I don't think it's any one thing. I think it's a confluence of several things that will make people successful. Like when I said you use geomancy to know the things that you don't know, you don't know. So for example, if you are thinking about quitting your job, not having really a plan, and then thinking you're gonna go off and do a Jupiterian ritual, or you're going to go and summon Klaunik, and you will just, mysteriously get the money to make your rent i mean maybe there's somebody that has done that and they can speak to it but that's not really a plan i mean it might work it might not work or you could also just find yourself homeless so you know that's the difference between magic and magical thinking you know I think yeah magic... quitting your job to dedicate yourself to to find to money magic is kind of a hilarious idea yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, the, the, the best approach would be to work the job that you already have and to stay with that, to stay stable in your life. And at the same time, explore other ritual work, divination to enhance your probabilities. Because I think of magic purely in terms of probabilities. You know, I think the things that I'm going to do they're going to increase the likelihood of me getting a desired outcome that I want. And to know those differences, again, not to harp on the term repeatedly, is to know the difference between magic and magical thinking. You know? I so. like that. Yeah, absolutely. The idea of not using magic to me in conjunction with your daily life and, and, and lifelong goals and... and you know, helping your friends and family and all that is seems a little odd. Like, why wouldn't you bring magic into your work? And here's the here's here's the reason I brought up Frater Acker because he says he's he's never found that magic helps you get worldly things. It's better just to get them directly. But then to just today on Foolish Fish, I was listening to him. Um, well, I was assessing whether or not I was healthy enough to even do the recording with you today because I'm, you know, still sick. Um, 
he mentioned that he writes all his books in contact with the spirits. Right? See where I'm going with this? Yeah, I do. <laughs> so it's like, so you don't need magic. You don't use magic to succeed in in mundane life. Yet, your books that are wildly successful are written with spirits. Which yeah, is, I, I would define that as using magic to help with your mundane success in life and arguably finances. Yeah, I mean, like I said earlier, I don't think it's any one thing. I think it's all of the above. Exactly. Uh, and for me, again, I can only speak about my own personal experiences. I think being stable and orderly in your life um, what do I mean by that? Having a routine, working out, exercising, eating right, um, just to the level that you can affect a routine that is good for your life. I think that those things make you a better magician. And yeah. if you widely diverge, don't have much of a routine, um, focus most of your time on just ritual things that you can do to gain material things, I, I really do believe that that does take a toll on people. And I can, I can name one example from somebody that I was studying with, and this individual uh, basically just stopped going to work, uh, got held up in her apartment, and was just essentially practicing ritual work and so on and so forth until she was evicted for not paying her rent and had to move back in with her parents. So as much as you can as a magician, keep your life stable, uh, eat right, exercise. If you can exercise, go on a walk at least regularly, meditate, have a routine. If you're calm and orderly in your life, I believe that those things will make you a better magician. But again, I'm, I'm only speaking about my own experience and I'm not trying to cast um, you know, sand on other people's efforts or what they do. I'm only talking about myself. Yeah, of course, of course. Um, understood. I always, I always do like to think of it in terms of Golden Dawn sort of spiritual alchemy language of, you know, preparing the Alembic. You know, it's like if, 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 if the magic for, for abundance and success is the fluid, you still have to have a vessel to put it in. And the vessel is you and your life. And if you've quit your job and quit all cut yourself off from all earthly avenues of success and then start calling on spirits to bring you success and abundance you've 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 shattered the vessel before, while and then tried to pour fluid into the broken pieces yeah exactly you've just totally lost the plot right there yeah. so. <laughs> oh it's so fun talking to another aquarius man this is great yeah. Well, this is great. I've been bored out of my skull since since getting sick last Sunday. And because I have autoimmune diseases, it takes me quite a long time to recover. Um, and uh, so this is wonderful. I've been, yeah, very happy. So I'm glad we got to touch on the the, the results magic thing. So I hear a lot of people hit me up on social media and are like, you know, magic, magic you can do anything you want with magic because it's all made up and there's no basis in history for anything being true or not true it's just whatever you want it to be and and this is something i'm hearing increasingly from from people online and it worries me i i try to gently show a different side to it but then they usually get very aggressive very fast which is very strange um it's almost like it's like well you know there's history to this they're like well it's just made up but that's skinner's point right if magic was all made up then at every point in human history we'd have radically different systems of magic around uh uh testify you know testified to in texts and, and and stuff but we don't we have actually rather consistent techniques and practices throughout all of history across many different cultures any thoughts on that and again sorry if i'm a little foggy from the all the pain pills no you're completely fine uh, again respectfully to those to those people mm -hmm. that say it's not made up I'm, I'm only going to give my own point of view. There have been people that have gone um, to the gallows for doing this. There are people that have been tortured or they've been put to the stake, essentially. Why would 
all of that have been done to those folks if it was all made up. You know, there's got to be some efficacy to it. Why would these people all be writing these books? Why would these books elicit? Uh, why would they, for the longest period of time, um, only traded among certain people that, you know, knew how to use them or had the intellect required to grasp the, the knowledge within those books. I, I do know some folks that are chaos magicians and so on. And, you know, I, I don't like to disagree or argue with people. I would rather show them my results than tell them my plans, as Einstein put it. And that's honestly what I believe, you know, that, that uh, essentially don't tell people your plans, just show them your results. If your results are good, in life, then you really don't need to disagree with somebody verbally or get contentious because a lot of the online chat groups, there's a lot of contentiousness and people argue and they bicker. I've always taken a different approach if somebody's doing something that's effective and they share an idea or a tip, you know, to the extent that they feel free to share, I think that it can be a wonderful avenue for learning, but as far as it's all made up and anything goes, you know, respectfully, I would disagree with that. Otherwise, why buy any books? Why practice out of out of any grimoire? It's all in your head. I mean, you know, none of it has none of it means anything. It's whatever you want it to be. So yeah, well, that's exactly where the pushback comes from often. Because I'll I'll talk about, I'll mention a historical technique or a grimoire, and people will say, you know, that's that's someone else's magic. It's not for you. You should stop promoting it. And and I'll be like, what are you talking about? But this is, I think that is the pre prevailing view now um, in, in, a cult, in the occulture, broadly speaking. Of course, things have become so popular. Of course, this, this wide net that has picked up so many people into magic now uh, inevitably is going to pick up a lot of new people who haven't gotten to go through the whole gamut of learning yet and testing and trying things out. And if you, if you extricate magic from results... Yeah, I think it's very easy to think that it's all whatever you want it to be and that there, it doesn't actually do what some people claim it does, especially regarding spirits. It's, it's sort of like what you had said earlier, the people that have a disdain for results-based things, they've never needed it. So... Yeah, you know, fucking richies. Right, I mean, if you're... <laughs> Like I said earlier, I'm, I'm a materialist first, and I have to be able to look at the results that I've got and be ruthlessly honest with myself. What did I do? What did I spend? And what result did I gain? You know, and be able to gauge things by that metric. And in all of those things, you, you've got to keep that in mind at, at all times, you know, that these are the things that I did. Have a diary, have a journal. I do this even with divination where I always look at my results and look back at what, what conditions I did the reading under, what I tried, what I didn't try, and look back and gauge your results, for example, and then judge your efficacy on those things. You know, and um, short of that, just I would just say don't engage with people. There are a lot of folks that engage in bad faith, not because they want to share something genuine or that they have you know, an approach that they want to also let people know about. But there's a lot of bad faith discourse and don't, you know, I would just tell people not to get caught up in that bad faith discourse and to argue and be contentious with people because everybody's time is precious, you know, yours, mine, everybody. And you only have the time that you have in this life and why spend it arguing with somebody online? It really doesn't mean anything. So if somebody disagrees with you and they say, oh, you know, it's all made up. I always just say, if you like it, I love it. You know? so, yeah. mm -hmm. awesome. Amen. The, uh, the most common thing, of course, you hear is, well, if, if magic could actually achieve mundane results, then every magician would be a millionaire. Sure. And That's the but... bottom argument they usually hit. And, no, exactly. Uh, and I always counter with, if a degree in finance made everybody a great trader on Wall Street, exactly, everybody would go ahead with a finance degree would be a Wall Street trader. However, they are not. 
Bazinga. Exactly. I like that. Uh, tons of people have the mental acuity to go to medical school. Some of them don't become doctors because they don't have the fortitude to deal with maybe blood or the physical aspects of being a doctor or looking at gore or viscera if somebody's injured and they have to settle for being something else. You know, maybe a radiologist or, or an anesthesiologist or something. So it's not like everyone who has the knowledge is going to go off and use that. People are all diverse. The ends to which they use things are equally diverse. There are some people that believe in theurgy, which is fine. You know, they'll use the magic to help, you know, accomplish that aim. And there are other people that will use it for financial outcomes. And I don't think anyone is right or wrong. You know, it's just what people put their mind to doing. Either which way, you are the thing that you invest your time in. And again, just to reiterate, don't argue with people online, because if you find yourself doing that a lot, you are that. So, you know, people have a contention or a bone to pick. Just say, okay, you know, that's, that's also okay. You know, I, if that's your result, then, or that's what you do, that's great. You know, but more power to you. Yeah, I always try and at least turn people on to the history of magic because I think it can, if they are open to it, if they do look into it, they might start to uh, take their practice more seriously. And, and if they do, then practice can show you things that you might not have believed are possible. I know when I joined the Golden Dawn, I didn't, I wasn't looking, I didn't want to join the Golden Dawn. I just wanted to not be alone anymore and not be limited to my little uh, three man high school Wiccan coven. You know, I wanted to be around serious people finally after, after years of you know, that, you know, sort of not having serious people around after years of being the one, who, the, the, the creative force in the group, you know? So I, when I, when I got into the golden dawn, it was around serious practitioners. Um, it was, uh, Oh damn, did I lose the thought? fucking fucking pain pills um i never take these things except when i'm brutally sick what was i saying i'm so sorry we were talking about uh, people being contentious online and oh. you advocating for learning from the grimoire and uh, the history of magic yeah oh so when i joined there was a whole list of things that i was i knew i would learn i knew i would probably find out uh, the extent to which they worked. And then there was a whole bunch of things that I didn't believe were possible and didn't ever think I would experience because I didn't believe that it was possible. And what was interesting in, in those years was how many of the things on the list that I was convinced I didn't even consider were, were realistically real. Um, how many of those things actually turn? I, I experienced. I experienced things that I never believed were possible to experience for anyone, and that was shocking. And it wouldn't have been possible if I hadn't trusted in in the experimental process that is magic. So I, I do try and push these people online when they come at me with this sort of make believe stuff. You know, it's all in your head. Um, like, yeah, you know, push the limits at least. Try it out. You know, try it. And see if maybe you will experience something you didn't previous believe previously believe was possible. Yeah, absolutely. Um, if people have not the 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 thing that I have noticed that sometimes people um, where I think that they tend to knock things sometimes is I've seen um, sometimes people they will get a book or they'll look up a particular spell and they might not have a lot of training or they might not have read the grimoire in its entirety. They'll just look at one particular spell or one particular thing and try that one thing and then it doesn't work and then they're ready to um, denounce the whole, the whole you know, endeavor or the whole field as, oh, you know, this thing doesn't work at all. Or sometimes uh, they will just grimoire hop you know one book to another just trying random things without buying a book learning it it's in it learning the book in its entirety going backwards and forwards to make sure that you know the invocations you memorize certain things 
you know how to draw the circle. Um, you have all manner of, of activities that pertain to that particular um, right that you're doing. Or even you've spoken with other people who have performed it successfully, but you're just kind of grimoire hopping without learning any of the philosophical aspects of magic. You're just looking at one page in a book and you're trying that out and it doesn't work for you and then you're ready to kind of denounce it all and say it's all in your head, you know, none of it is really anything. And, you know, those are, I think that's sort of, um, some folks are looking for an easy, an easy result or they're looking to get something like really quick. And in my, again, in my observation and my experiences, it, it's never worked that way. If you experiment with the Keys of Solomon, if that's your grimoire, as a lot of people, that is the first thing that they try. It's the first thing that I learned. And if you're experimenting with that and you're documenting what you're doing, you're observing other people, what they do, you're following the steps, about as close to the letter as you can follow it. If you are trying to do all of those steps and you get the result, you can have an honest dialogue and say, I tried this and this was the result, or I tried these things and I didn't get much of a result. Can someone recommend something? Because you know the book, you know you've done the fast, you've drawn the circle, you know what you're doing. But to just randomly read a page or look it up online or see what other people are doing and kind of grimoire hop, I guess is the term I use, just looking at a page and trying something. Yeah, that's a great term. Yeah, I, I don't think that that will be effective, you know. And I will further on with saying that the more other esoteric practices that you can incorporate into your life from other disciplines, the more effective you can be as a magician. For example, I've been doing yoga for about you know, seven to eight years, yeah, probably maybe even a little bit longer than that. But if you can take aspects of yoga, uh, raising energy, I use a lot of Qigong exercises. Um, the microcosmic orbit is just one of them. Prior to any kind of spiritual invocation, I will use uh, either a yoga routine that I do raise energy yogic breathing techniques also there's a ujjayi breath that you can use to stimulate the muscles all of these things they help you tap into the subtle senses the subtle body you are not going to get that uh, depth of information by just reading one page and trying something and saying it did not work so you know it's it's a process i believe i really do believe that the more things that you know, the more of the book that you read, the philosophical approaches that you can incorporate. Well, I don't, well, I don't believe in, let's say, the golden dawn, the theurgical aspect of magic or the inner alchemy. I don't believe in those things, maybe because they're not for me. Not that there's anything wrong with them. Again, they're perfectly fine. But... I do think that there is a lot of things that you can learn from other practitioners by looking at their what they do or having a dialogue with other people, a good faith dialogue, not to just pick points and to argue with them online and denounce them and so on and so forth. You can learn a lot, but a lot of it does depend on you buying the book, reading it to in its entirety, knowing the things backwards and forwards, and then trying it out. Absent that, your results will be whatever you put into it. And a lot of people, sadly, they put more time into arguing online than they do into reading books because arguing online is easier. Yeah, yeah. It's, uh, you know, I, I think they get some, uh, you know, well, we all know, we all know a lot about what social media was designed to do these days, of course. And uh, there's a lot of people who have, gotten addicted to that and the, the the dopamine of owning someone on the web yeah absolutely i i can i'll give you an example so i've always done ritual work very sparingly and it's not uh because i was afraid to do things a lot of the ritual work that i would do 
because I do believe in magic. I do believe that, yes, there are things if done incorrectly, they do present a risk to obviously the practitioner. And prior to doing anything, I wanted to know that I'm doing everything that I can. I've done the fast, I have the right equipment, everything has been consecrated, and so on and so forth. So I've compared sometimes even things that I have done for myself, okay, and observe other people doing maybe a similar ritual. And sometimes even people with how you say the words to an incantation can make a difference. I've seen some people, if you are, if I'm doing an incantation, I'm reciting it in a way that I believe it with conviction. And there are some people that will literally just mumble out the incantation. And yep. if you don't believe what you're doing, doubt, self-doubt especially, is absolutely terminal for any, any kind of right that you're doing. So I'll tell you the operation that I was doing. It was the bornless, headless right at the start of the pandemic. Which one, the bornless or the headless? So it's the headless right. It's the one that it's is a, in the PGM, the yeah, Stelly of Jew. Yes, with the uh, got it from Gordon Whitehead's the Chaos Protocols because he copied um, Jake Strap and Ken's Four Kings and threw that in there. Oh, really? Cool. Yes. And cool. during the pandemic in 2020, so everything was kicking off. Like I said before, I've used any ritual work that I've done. I've done it very sparingly uh, because I want to know what I'm doing before I attempt a ritual. In 2020, I, I don't know what it was like in Canada, but in the U.S., there was a lot of fear. Uh, there was people that were dying. There were people that were um, going to the hospital and just falling sick and dying because this pandemic was spreading very quickly. Yeah, I lost three friends during lockdown in Canada. Wow, I'm very yeah. sorry to hear that. Yeah, well, they, got, they weren't allowed to work, and then they were evicted and died on the streets. Yeah, wow. That's, Brutal, hey? That's... And I didn't even know until it was too late, like because everyone was keeping to themselves. No one felt like they wanted to bother other people with their shit because we all had to... We all lost so much. I I lost a lot, if not everything. But you know, uh, that sounds bad. I don't mean it. it's just it was. It's been brutal. It was brutal. No, it absolutely is. I I can tell you. I, I've known it's people a that are traumatized from it. Honestly, no, I and that's completely understandable. Like I said, we've come out of a pandemic. It was like mass trauma, and not a lot of people have really come to grips with societally what's happened. We've undergone this traumatic experience and i think fellowship with other people you know non-contentious fellowship will definitely you know is a thing that people should do uh, to recover so what i did at the start of 2020 i was living with my partner uh, at my home and we were observing on the news people going to the hospital falling sick people were dying nobody really knew how they were going to keep themselves safe so on and so forth. Then we had some instructions to mask. There was no vaccine. Um, again, I'm, you know, both my partner and myself, we had to work our jobs and try to keep about as safe as possible so that neither one of us got the other person sick. And I thought, okay, well, you know, this is an extreme situation and I'm going to try some ritual work to keep both of us safe. And I did do the rite from the Chaos Protocols with the Four Kings. And it was at that point when I had done that rite, I did notice uh, the words that were said were with conviction. I believe that, yes, the, these words that I'm saying are going to have an effect. That here I am when I'm enunciating these words, there are spiritual forces that are taking note of me, that I'm not just a non-entity, a non-being. When I say these words with conviction, when I do this right, and you know, there are a couple of other things that I did prior to actually doing the right, um, like some Qigong exercises to raise the bodily energy that I really believe are effective for something like um, 
the uh, Headless Strike from Gordon Whitehead's book. And I noticed a rapid turnaround mm. in just my own material well-being. And I was able, both my partner and me, we had gone out. We had to. Neither one of us have extended family that we can rely on. It was just me and her, and we had to keep each other safe. And I'd done that right once, and I noticed some fairly quick turnaround in some things that were happening. I did some geomantic divination that confirmed some of what I was doing was right. It was I was on the right path. It led me to start experimenting more and more and perhaps doing work more frequently because I was in uncharted waters. I, I don't know if I go to the grocery store and get groceries if that was going to be you know, something that endangered my partner when I came home, even though I was wearing a mask. So, you know, in, in a lot of that situation, I did have to, I had conviction in what I was doing. I believed in what I was doing. And I never doubted that the words that I was saying and the ritual that I was doing had an effect. But, you know, that's something that only can come from within a person if they believe in the efficacy of magic in its entirety. Obviously, some things are more effect, efficacious than others. But if they have that doubt or they're just trying it to just, okay, let's just see what happens. I don't know if they will be very successful. Conviction is something only you can have. I don't think it's something anyone can instill in you. And now I observed another friend doing the exact same ritual, the exact same thing, the same book, the same ritual, the same words. I memorize certain parts of the ritual so I would not need to look at the book. I had ritual offerings, so on and so forth. This other individual that I was in fellowship with, I relayed the same information to him exactly verbatim, the steps that I did. I watched him do exactly the same thing. The thing that differed between me and him is this man had no conviction. His words mm -hmm. when he was saying them were kind of mumbled. He didn't memorize any of the words. He had to constantly look at the book so on and so forth. So I think conviction is something that's essential. Doubt will kill any magical operation. Yeah, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's, it's so true. It's so true. I mean, it's one of the most uh, powerful lessons that I learned um, in the Golden Dawn was, was the importance of passion, conviction, and fervency of spirit when you're doing this work. It's, it's so crucial. And it's something that I hadn't learned from, you know, reading uh, everything before that in the early 90s. And, you know, like, I didn't really get that from all the Druid and Wiccan literature. I would make my altar, I would do the prayers and stuff, but I didn't really understand that all of that physicality of that emotion, that meaning, that passion and, and desire was so important. I would I would only really find success in my magic in the early days when I would go into deep meditative or astral states, because that was what I knew how to do well early on. I was raised in a yogic family. So I was raised in that kind of deep meditation environment. Um, didn't really know anything about Christianity until I was a teenager. And, and so my magic worked that way. But then in the golden dawn, I realized that in ritual work, if you, you know, Frater Ka, Nidiv Ashadrach was all about the passion and all about the energy and all about the meaning. And that just made a, a whole world of difference. And I didn't understand that theoretically, a lot of that has to do with interaction with spirits and how that works. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. But once you understand that at its core, and let's say you've taken up other disciplines, right? Like, let's say you practice Qigong. I want to talk about, I wanted to, I've been wanting, oh my God, I'm so glad you mentioned that. There's a group down that practices at the park of a bunch of old Chinese people. And I've been thinking about joining them all summer. And I think next summer I will, because it looks really awesome. Yeah, absolutely. Like uh, Qigong techniques, like the microcosmic orbit. That's an exercise that I use prior to any spirit work. It just raises your bodily energy in such a way that I believe makes your subtle body more receptive. That is a technique that I can vouch for, um, practicing yoga. Again, it's not for everybody, but I think once you learn the overall fundamentals of how some of this works, you can look at other like 
disciplines like yoga and qigong and look at what things from those disciplines you can incorporate into your own magical practice and some of them are highly syncretic uh, meditation uh, certain yogic breathing techniques things like that these are all things that i think a magician can incorporate into their work you know the other thing is a lot of people they say um i guess it's sort of um I, I don't know exactly the term that some people they use i think it's like cultural appropriation to, uh, take, <laughs> to use it sorry sorry or, yeah or to take qigong and use it in, in magic but i i don't believe that that or even geomancy like Oh, it's an Arabic practice. It's cultural appropriation. <laughs> I think you yeah. that. I mean, you know, even if I was not the child of a biracial marriage, I would still not believe in that because this knowledge is out there, you know, and in the the world that we live in, life is extremely hard. Why would you not try to get ahead by learning and trying to take all the tools at your disposal and use them towards the ends that you want? Of course, within reason. Yeah, but I believe we're going to try to be successful in this life. That there are things that other spiritual practices and discipline can teach you. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. I think I've. I think my podcast is scared off long ago. Anyone who's on that cultural appropriation horse and you know riding around town, town trying to berate anyone who's you know, it, if if that was a thing then you shouldn't learn foreign languages because you're appropriating their language and therefore the way in which they conceive of things and thought, you know, or something like that. It's, it's, I find it absolutely ridiculous. I do agree with the academic interpretation Dr. Puka did on one of her episodes where like legit cultural appropriation is like, you know, stealing someone's, a thing from someone's culture just to, to shill it, you know, like calling yourself a, a shaman and doing sweat lodges down the street from a first nation's, a uh, place that actually does it just to make money off them. That's cultural appropriation in a gross way. But the rest, I don't, you know, I think it's kind of ridiculous. Like, uh, I agree with you. And I was, Fred Ocker was talking about sort of the, the balancing point between chaos magic and, 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 uh, and uh, Solomonic magic on his uh, interview with Denny today. Um, and I think that is a, I think there's nothing wrong with this syncretic, middle of the road do whatever works approach especially as if we're magicians you know i know i'm sort of ran, uh, a little scattered here but that's the that's the that's the no, drugs not, i mean i i i absolutely agree with syncretism i mean look at the pgm you know the pgm is this beautiful syncretic mix of like all kinds of cultures you know uh greeks egyptians so on yeah. and so forth yeah and they're throwing <laughs> everything into a blender you know and there i believe i strongly believe that if you're a magician you can use what is efficacious in the name of dionysus Ra, jesus and mohammed <laughs> yeah i mean okay so you're gonna learn another practice right like i i've learned yoga and i incorporate certain yoga techniques into aspects of my own practice but do I don't like I, I take this really seriously. I go to a studio that specializes in an, basically Ashtanga, which is the kind of yoga that I do. I know a lot about the roots of this particular practice. Uh, obviously, I'm approaching it with sincerity, with respect, uh, as it deserves such a, a rich tradition like Ashtanga. And knowing those things and approaching it with sincerity and treating it respectfully i don't believe is you don't have to worry about cultural appropriation come on in the water is just fine just be respectful approach things with sincerity learn the roots of something and try it out and if it fits in your practice all well and good if it doesn't you know move on to try something else yeah absolutely absolutely um no, so, I, I had to pull out all the stops magically myself during the pandemic. Like I was I was in California when it started and I was in a very life threatening situation as the pandemic moved on and on into it. it just got more and more dangerous and risky. I just, 
you know, I, the idea that I wouldn't use a technique to improve my life or to help me survive the situation because it belonged to a different culture. It's, I don't know, I, I don't know where this is coming from in our world today, but it seems so absurd. Yeah, I mean, I, I generally think things like meditation or even having some kind of physical practice. Uh, when I was young, I took up boxing, um, not because I like being punched a lot, but because of the physicality of it. Yeah. Um, I think having, you know, martial arts or even working out or yoga or some, some physical practice, meditation, these things don't just make you a better magician. They make you a better person to be around. I think when you have that routine, when you're tying yourself to a physical practice of some sort, you're grounding yourself down. I think those things, they make you more rooted. They give you a routine. They give structure to your life. And I'm not saying you can't have those things absent that, not making that argument. But I'm just saying that I think that those things, they enhance who you are. They enhance your practice. And, you know, if you're living, cohabiting with a partner, they just make you a better person to be around. Amen. Amen. Um, so before we move on, a last, a last point on the cultural appropriation thing, because I know it's such a hot topic that a lot of magicians have to put disclaimers on their website or like Jack Rails, his, his whole website to me looks like one big um, argument to appease those who are worried that practicing magic is a cultural appropriation and his website's very much aimed at like letting you know, no, it's not. Um, if, if you do it this way or whatever, um, I don't mean to, you know, anyway. Oh, okay. So a friend who has been on the podcast before, Ray, a good comedian friend from the States, sort of your neck of the wood, I think. Then again, my geography is not perfect, but she was asking me about Kabbalah as cultural appropriation and, and stuff. Cause uh, she was criticized by her friends, I think, uh, for getting, having a studying it in a book club and getting into a bit. And there, her Jewish friend or something like that was telling her that this was uh, not good. Like, you know, this is evil. This is you're stealing someone's sacred stuff and you can't do that. And she asked me what I thought. And I was like, well, I started studying Kabbalah, of course, the normal magical way through like Dion Fortune and McGregor Mathers, you know. But when in 97, when I was in living in Vienna, I started learning from a Hasidic rabbi and he outlined me a course of study, gave me some lessons. And why would he do that? If there was a problem with it, right? You know, it doesn't, you know, so there's a Hasidic rabbi teaching Kabbalah to a Gentile. And why would they, why would they make all these YouTube videos now that they're making if, if, if they didn't want people to study it? Um, another, another, uh orthodox jewish person i've been working with i mean his his whole thing is to get these texts out to people in the english world who are not jewish so they can understand god better like where's there's the idea of cultural appropriation just doesn't even exist in that context and therefore i argue it doesn't make sense in any context but just sort of a last thought on that right but also magic is built on successive technologies so well said. when two cultures come into contact with each other, at first they notice only the differences and later they notice all the similarities. When people do notice the similarities, they're going to want to know what those folks are doing. And like I said, looking at something like the PGM, you have this wonderful and beautiful co-mingling of cultures that produces this great syncretic work of magic. And if they were doing it back then and learning from each other, I, I really sincerely believe as long as you're taking a practice and you're approaching it with sincerity and you're trying to learn the heritage and staying true to it and you're respectful in the way that you practice that, I think that, I mean, again, just me, I believe that, you know, it's, it can be something that can enhance your life and, you know, not to be dissuaded from something just because it doesn't belong to your culture. Like yoga doesn't belong to my culture particularly, but, you know, I took it up anyway because it has a lot to, to offer me in terms of quality of life. And, you know, I, I believe that everyone should have that approach as long as they're doing it respectfully and 
you know, staying true to the heritage of a thing. There's nothing wrong with it. Yeah, I don't think you'd have all these yogis like Paramahansa and, and Maharishi traveling around the world promoting their practices if they thought they were, you know, meant to be a closed thing. It just it doesn't track. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, good. Let's we can move on from this the cultural appropriation thing. It's always nice to get it out there since so many new people are getting the wrong idea about all of this stuff. Mm-hmm. What do you think? Um uh oh, I don't think I can I, I was I was wanted to do with some sort of creative smooth segue into this next thing, but alas, I can't come up with anything brilliant. So let's just lay it out there. What happened, do you think, in the Enlightenment? Okay, so... We'll so this is the period everybody... after the Renaissance, for those of you who are perhaps young, uh, around the year 16, 17, 1800. Yeah, so, okay, we'll just give, we'll just give people some context. So you and I were chatting back and forth, and... Uh, this is a conversation I also had with a very good friend of mine about um, magic and the Enlightenment. And a lot of folks say that magic or the Enlightenment killed magic. And I don't believe that that is exactly correct. I mean, I'll just give you my own interpretation of it. So I really do think that the Enlightenment and Further down the line, I would say capitalism as an economic force, it tended to take the parts of magic that could be quantified and measured into the metrics that that it gauges everything. You know, the same metrics that they use for Amazon workers, people that work on a factory floor, or people that answer the phone, if they could take those metrics and apply it to something, then it was real and it had intrinsic value. And if it did not, then that thing was just basically cast aside and it was deemed to not have any value anymore. Now, I had shared an article with you about uh, AI powered chatbots that are basically being created to give people closure so that it, these AI powered chatbots will seem like a deceased person's loved one and that they could still talk to that person and you know via AI powering these chatbots to make the person seem like a grieving person's deceased loved one. So they could, you know, still communicate or maybe ask them a question or so on and so forth. And if you ask me, that's just like basically capitalism doing a seance, you know, for all intents and purposes. Oh God, that's, uh, that's hilarious. Yeah, no, it's, it's, it's something that I don't think a lot of magic practitioners really think about, right? So, for mm. example, if during, during, you could say you know, the formative years of capitalism, you know, we're talking about 17th century, uh, late 17th century, uh, early 18th century, you're gonna start, you have this new economic system, these large societal upheavals, you've got the enclosure laws, you've got people that are gradually being herded into cities and by extension to work in factories and so on. And then you also have the, I guess, the esoteric practices that people would have been practicing up until that time. And it just appeared to me that capitalism was able to just take the aspects of esoteric practices that it could somehow utilize for itself, like let's say glamour magic, and that you know morphed into advertising, or you taking uh-huh. something like, that's so true. Yeah. I mean, uh, granted, sigil magic came much later, but you're looking at a McDonald's golden arches. Now, you tell me that that is not sigil magic. <laughs> and we can have that discussion. But I mean, there are people that can, you don't even have not even encountered a McDonald's, but will look at the golden arches and know that, oh, wow, okay, I, I think that that's fast food. Yeah, I've seen that somewhere. 
Oh, I remember as a kid, it's if me and my sister were in the back seat of the car and we're driving along, we caught even a glimmer of yellow in the distance. We would just freak out. We would freak out. We would do everything in our power to get our parents to pull in there or go through the drive through You know, like we're talking about threatening to cry, threatening to fight each other, pretending to fight each other, temper tantrums, guilt trips, like pouty faces. You know, when we we're like four and seven, we would do whatever it took. <laughs> Powerful stuff. Even though, even though back then it meant that we would probably have to go inside and breathe in cigarette smoke the entire time because everyone smoked in them oh, yeah. <laughs> so like that would make us cry we hated it but it was worth it was so it's a weird thing we'd want to go in to have that smell even though there'd be people blowing smoke in our faces it's fucked up but it's so weird powerful magic no absolutely um so there is also if like you chaos know. magician buddy uh edward edward wrote a book called uh uh, the art of memetics and it, he's it, so it's a chaos magic perspective on early memetics um that's out there on amazon quite interesting book actually sorry oh, just... check that out yeah yeah I, I was also thinking that the whole practice of mindfulness for example um i won't say that i'm buddhist by any means but there is a Buddha center over here in the Midwest that I had frequented and I befriended the man that runs the Buddha center and I learned some Buddhist meditational techniques from him and so on. And, you know, another good example of capitalism sort of taking an esoteric practice and then trying to quantify it and then giving it an intrinsic value where previously it had none. Uh, you know, you could look at mindfulness, the whole, whole trend of be mindful. You know, that's something that a lot of the Silicon Valley gurus said, you know, that they are investing tons of money in mindfulness. And if you look at traditional Buddhist meditation and the spiritual undergirding of those meditational techniques, Western style mindfulness is divorcing all of the esoteric practices from Buddhism meditational techniques. And just turning it into mindfulness so that you can be a better programmer or maybe type an extra line of coding or two extra lines of coding, you know, for, for whatever hour or by whatever metric that they use to measure you as an individual. And that's just, you know, a couple of examples of, I think, how the system that we all live in, you know, the economic model that we all live in only tends to prize the things that it can quantify and assign a numerical value to. But if it can't be sold and ergo it can't be allotted a numerical value, or you know, it's just not real. It has no intrinsic value whatsoever and discard it. As a matter of fact, your um, you know uh, will be looked at like some sort of uh, backward person for adopting a particular practice because it does not have that intrinsic value or numerical value or monetary value you see what i mean yeah of course of course i i think about this a lot it's that's why i was really excited to talk to you about this whole the the legacy post enlightenment from the enlightenment onward um up through you know from like things like anton mesmer up through new thought um and how that feeds into uh, consumerism marketing capitalism because yeah. a lot of the spirituality you see promoted by our culture is stuff that is is very transcendental, very much aimed at like yoga, helping you rise above the the anxieties and issues caused to us by the world we've created so that they don't bother us as much. Like, you know, transcend it, rise above it. If it's bothering you, rise above it so that you don't worry anymore about the fact that we're trapped in a consumerist hellscape just go shopping you know do your yoga pay your 500 dollars a month yoga club membership fees so that you're relaxed enough to get through the rest of the day and rise above the stressors that are trying to point out that we're in a fucked up culture that needs to be improved so you know by spiritually bypass those the anxieties caused by our systems 
so that the systems can work better and make you a better consumer. No, exactly. And a lot of a lot of these things, what they are aiming to do is to keep you productive and to keep you, I guess, complacent. I, Probably we studied this a lot in seminary, actually, uh, under the top field uh, heading of resistance theology, which is really big. Um, and, you know, because myst within mysticism, there's been a trend to, since the Enlightenment, push a transcendentalizing mysticism that push teaches you to accept the th things the way they are and and ignore the stressors caused by our societies that would not normally if you weren't so skilled at whatever practice that helps you transcend those stressors would normally urge you to revolution or change but instead you know you go to your you do your your practice and all of a sudden you're you're back to being a peaceful peaceful purchaser yeah i mean i i, I kind of look at so i'll give you another good example a, a while back there was a company called ritualist and they were a company that specialized, I believe, in creating workplace rituals oh, that wow. would make your oh. make employees more productive or, you know, make them more invested in the business. A subsection and, of Palantir Enterprises, no doubt. Oh, my God, yes. Ex oh, Palantir, exactly. Yeah. You know, the taken from the seeing stones from mm. Lord of the Rings, you know, a, a childhood... You I I put up a clip on Palantir on my YouTube page and it got removed. Oh, it's the only video uh, they removed without notification. They just deleted it. Oh, buddy, they're on to you. <laughs> oh, big time. I'm shadow banned on most platforms. Yeah. Except so, for YouTube and obviously no longer now Twitter, thank God. So I'm actually going to try and, you know, but on Instagram, Facebook, like on Facebook, if I put up a post, I get at most like usually one like that doesn't make any sense when you have 2000 friends oh no exactly and you know like like we were saying i think like, no one sees me there i'm invisible to all my everyone on on my personal facebook they've just yeah. erased me sadly sadly they can they can do that with you know with the way the algorithms work these days they can make you very visible or just kind of completely erase you and you know I, I i definitely think the whole discourse of you know the enlightenment kill magic i i i mean my own point was i think that the enlightenment and by extension the economic system we live in took aspects of magic that it could quantify and measure and assign a numerical value and then turn that into a product and absent that you know it, Basically, it was believed that these things have no value. So, I mean, if there are any people that ever doubted what they were doing or the efficacy of a grimoire based approach or magic in its totality, I mean, think about some of the examples that, you know, that you and me just cited. You know, if that was, if it was as, uh, um, if it didn't have any efficacy, why would they be borrowing from these, these aspects of magic? To turn them into things you know that people can use yeah absolutely mitch horowitz talks a lot about that uh, from the very pro-capitalist side um and i, re I remember uh someone else um gary lockman was talking about the use of chaos magic by the the trump trumpers i guess um you know in the creation and promotion of like the the frog Head, which I still don't understand, but whatever. Um, and and I, I remember this interview asking Gary Lockman, what are you talking about? You're saying there's like a bunch of MAGA magicians out there using sorcery to aid their side? And he's like, yes, exactly. And they yeah, really just didn't know what to make of it. John Michael Greer, uh, he detailed that in a very, very, very good book that he wrote. Um, you know, John Michael Greer, man, the really yeah, I love him. Yeah, uh, The King in Orange, and you have got to read John Michael Greer's account of how that phenomenon, what you just described, uh, the Pepe logo and how people were using it on 4chan and things like that, to see um, his, his account of how that transpired. It's truly an amazing, 
amazing book to read. I cannot recommend that book enough to a lot of people. What's it so, called? Uh, the King in Orange. Okay, yeah, I'll check that out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. After Arthur Chambers, The King in Yellow, but since it's Trump, it was The King in Orange. <laughs> oh, yeah. Hilarious. <laughs> I, 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 yeah, yeah, no, I mean, it's been surreal. The world's been surreal since 2016. Oh, What's my your- God. Do you, do you just a little aside before and i don't want to leave our general theme of the enlightenment at all but a general aside a little side do you have any thoughts on the whole cern thing on the whole on the whole what cern cern the collider no no really i'm not sure educate me what is well they turned it on i believe in 2016 they did they used oh, the it hadron collider? Uh, yeah the hadron yeah in cern okay yeah, and they do these weird rituals and ceremony. Well, they call them ceremonies or celebrations, but they are occult rituals, like riding bulls or devils or stuff like that. Like I watched one of them, and it was, it was a ritual. It was a massive ritual, similar to like the Moloch worship at Bohemian Grove and all that. Um, you know, the, the idea that these things that these people are ignorant of the magical side of working with spirits, I think, is uh, a fallacy. I think. The people, a lot of some of the people, there's key people that are aware of it, just like Hitler had key people who knew what they were doing. Yeah, uh, I mean, from just my own reading of um, from my just my own reading of history, uh, it did seem like, you know, that there. Yeah, that there were people in the in the Reich that were practicing occult, you know, um, occult rituals and so on and so forth and you know big time so, yeah so yeah that, yeah my my phd supervisor nicholas goodrick clark is was is the was the world's leading expert on that on the vril society uh, he wrote all the the three books savitri devi hitler's priestess the black sun and uh, the occult roots of nazism so that was one of the reasons i wanted to study with him because i was like what the fuck happened there and how do we make sure it doesn't happen again and now guess what it's happening again yeah um like when you say it's happening again can you elaborate on that oh well uh perfect case in point is is what happened yesterday or the other day on with 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 what's happening with with yay west oh the the revival of the nazi movement on a large scale like you have one of the most popular human beings in the world who just said, I like Hitler, everyone has something to give, and I think Hitler gave more than most people, and he, the Nazis are good. Oh my God, that, yeah. that man has lost his mind. He he has objectively for sure, his, For sure, but he, thinking of it outside of the psychological realm, like thinking of it in a macro, magical realm, like societally, like he, he's representative, I think. I think he's a, what's a, what do they call it, a bell whistle or... Uh, um uh he's a i think he's an indicative what's going on with him is indicative of of a new rising fascism like in canada we 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 we're 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 completely under totalitarian rule now like our prime minister's just gone full fascist i mean we're trying to do something about that but yeah you know, he invoked wartime measures so that he could, you know, it's just dystopian that a lot of the factors that, that allowed Nazi Germany to happen are happening again, is the main point. Yeah, I don't know enough about Canadian politics to offer an opinion or a take or, or anything of that sort. But I mean, what I can say is I think Kanye West is completely despicable. It's a completely despicable man. Oh yeah. Oh, for I, sure. <laughs> I feel really bad for him. I don't know what prompted him to become the man that he he is right now and to say these things. If I'm being charitable, I will say it's maybe mental health, which I know he struggled with. However, the thing is, I don't think it is, man. I honestly, that's this is my unpopular hot take. I don't think it's mental illness. I really don't. I mean, I wish it was. I sort of hope it is but i'm afraid it's not i mean you know i'm I'm only speaking as as a as a young man that grew up listening to his music 
that I, you know, I, I would listen to his music and I, you know, not that I invested too much in, you know, him as a person, but to look at the man who wrote that music and to see the man that's saying these horrible things with the platform that he has, I, I don't recognize that. But, you know, nevertheless, mental health issues or not, you are responsible for the words that come out of your mouth. And I believe that, you know, irrespective, he's, whatever he's saying, you do have to take him at his word that he does believe it. And if that's what he's saying, then he's just a very despicable um, individual, you know, and he's no longer the, the person that uh, maybe a lot of people believe that he was. And yeah, he's just despicable. And that's about all I think anybody can say about him. And, uh, you know, perhaps we should just leave that issue over there for, you know, for time being and just move on because, yeah, there's nothing much that can be said about him that has not already been said that he's really not a good human being to uh, spouse such wild and despicable views. Amen. Yeah, no, I think, uh, yeah, I totally agree. I've, I've never put much stock in any of the any, any celebrities, to be honest. <laughs> but, <laughs> you know, it's like, uh, yeah. I the, the, the crazy thing is the idea that magic is playing a role in this in the in the shifts in the world today that's the weird idea that that it's come back to play a role in politics in a major way i i don't know if it has but just thinking of what gary lockman has has said and what you mentioned about uh john michael greer's assessments it seems like it's happening which is you know kind of and i didn't know about bohemian grove until just a little while ago so and then i was like oh shit they worship moloch and do group rituals that's crazy and then someone pointed me out to the CERN. I'm like, oh, again, they're doing these group rituals and trying to change the world through magic and technology in a way that is very fused. And that brings us back to the Enlightenment, right? Yeah, I mean, I don't know enough about Bohemian Grove or its history enough to, again, proffer. Yeah, me, uh, me neither. Uh, I mean... You know, there's some things that clearly if I don't know nothing about, I will, you know, keep silent or just say that I don't know. But in John Michael Greer's book, The King in Orange, he does make a um, fairly effective argument for the fact that people in groups, you know, um, projecting, I guess, their, their desire or I don't know, for want of a better word, that that does seem to have en masse some kind of effect and you know even you can look at the if you're on reddit when they were talking about the um shorting the um it was the that was a video it was like a video rental company i can't remember the name uh but there was a company that was it was on Reddit where a bunch of Redditors, they would pick a particular stock and then they would... GameStop. GameStop, yeah. sorry. Yes, it wasn't video. It was a game rental. Company. Yeah, I watched that documentary recently, actually. It was really good. Exactly. So I think that that is a really good example of how projecting a desire in mass, um, you know, can literally move uh things or move reality in a completely different direction you know as an individual maybe you can affect at least how magic was explained to me when i was learning side by side with a mentor that magic works in the ways that you can affect things that you have contact with or things that you have put out into the world you can affect and manipulate those things but I think it works quite differently when you find yourself in a forum with maybe you know a thousand, two thousand other people, you know, and you guys are all projecting a desire for things, and you know, you furthermore you're using financial tools to affect that desire, and it can move reality in some pretty crazy ways, as the whole GameStop um, incident, you know, displayed to a lot of people. Yeah, I mean, it was so effective. They literally had to cheat to stop those people, right? They had to shut down trading on Robinhood. Oh, exactly. Yeah, Robinhood actually had to slow down trades 
because a hedge fund was taking such massive losses. Well, they destroyed was... two hedge funds. Oh, yeah. They wiped yeah, them yeah. out, yeah. And how many more would have gone if they hadn't cheated and stopped their ability to buy more stock? Exactly. Yeah. And there were guys... So much for the that. name Robin Hood, eh? <laughs> That's the big, the best irony in all of this. It's like, oh, oh my God. God. Yeah, and there were guys on that forum who are now suing Robin Hood. I'm not sure about the outcome of that. Good. But there were people that were suing Robin Hood for doing that because they would have stood to make even more money. So uh, I guess like the, uh, I guess the big takeaway from that whole thing is when you put groups of people together and they project a, a, a desire and it's cohesive and you have other people buying into whatever the, the desire or the game plan is that it does have for good or for ill and hopefully for people will use it for good and societal you know, betterment that you know it can affect things and can move mountains well they certainly paid back the little guy for what the little guy did at with gamestop with ftx eh they're like oh, oh you think God. yeah if you look at that as sort of a revenge for what happened with gamestop i know it probably wasn't but you know yeah the the whole shit yeah, the whole like FTX thing is is just horrible. I, I really just, exactly. I I really do believe that the whole um, issue with FTX that that's going to lead to a lot of reverberations further down the line. I don't think that them going belly up. I don't know if you've read, but today it was Kraken, which was, I think. The second or maybe third largest crypto exchange had also laid off um, thousands of employees. So uh, I think we're only beginning to see the reverberations of FTX and Sam Bankman Fried's financial chicanery. We're going to see. And, you know, it's really a sad thing because I know friends that have invested in crypto and they have lost, you know, a lot of money and it's, it's very bad. It's, you know, this is hard, hard-earned cash that people have invested with this, with this guy, and he just, you know, blew it. You know, he just like took their money. Yeah. He just made off with their money. Yeah, you know, uh, Bernie made off stuff. <laughs> <laughs> you know. Yeah. Well, fun, and he's still it. giving lecture tours and and being touted as this genius. Yeah, you know, I. <laughs> it's so it's I, so transparently corrupt. It's insane. Oh my God! Yeah, like so. Sam basically, Bankman, it was basically just laundering American tax dollars through crypto from the Ukraine to give it back to the politicians. I mean, I don't know enough about. I, I'm just speculating based on what it seems like was probably the big plan or whatever. I don't know. We don't. We're just talking shit, right? Yeah, I mean, I I don't know enough about like that aspect of things, or even if that was a thing. I mean, I do know that. He did have um, he did have a hedge fund, and that the commingling of funds between his hedge fund and his crypto exchange to cover basically um, his the hedge funds uh, yeah. basic bets, you know, is what drove this thing to go belly up. But you know, I mean, hopefully that you know that some of the folks can recover at least, hopefully some of their funds, and you know. Or, or hopefully that this will be the last time that something like that happens. So, I mean, that's one of the reasons. That's probably the only upside to us even talking about it and and and, and tr- stressing out some of you wonderful listeners with this discussion. The reason to talk about it is if you've got your head in the sand or you're just you're just saying, well, it doesn't bother me or affect me, so I don't need to worry about it. That's not true. Like this is on us. This is on the people. We got to be aware of what's going on. We got to start saying stuff. We got to say enough is enough. We got to vote better people into office. We got to have better people run for office because unfortunately, as much as it would be nice to have some sort of miraculous revolution that turned everything better, that's probably not going to happen. It's probably going to be slow shifts, whichever way you cut it. And that sort of brings me back to my thinking about the role that we can play as magicians in the world in improving the world, improving the lives of our immediate environment, friends and family and, and neighbors through 
the, the, the community of spirits and saints and gods that we can invoke to act and improve our lives, you know, and improve the, even politics. I'm a big believer in that sort of, well, I'm, a, I'm an Enochian magician, right? So, of course, I'm very interested in using magic to improve the, the world. Yeah, I mean, I I think given, you know, the fact that we live in a really fraught day and age with so many different challenges, you know, I, I definitely think that if you do want to change a lot of things, the first thing that you can do is start by changing yourself, develop a routine that you can follow, keep yourself about as healthy as you can, you know, take up some kind of physical practice as, as a man. You know, it doesn't have to be weightlifting if that's not your thing. It can be other physical disciplines, martial arts, something of that sort. But keep yourself healthy and affect change on the level first affecting yourself. If you're not healthy and, you know, you're not taking care of yourself, you cannot affect any larger changes in your immediate surroundings. It all begins with, you know, you as an individual. Well, as someone with who's really basically been dying since one years old due to autoimmune diseases. I do think you can still have a big effect, even if you're kind of fucked in your own physical body. Yeah. And, and please don't, don't take what I said to mean. Oh, I don't. Of, of, of that sort. I don't, I absolutely don't mean it in that sense. Um, of course, all life has merit. And every day that you wake up in the morning, you have an ability to turn things around in whatever way that you can. Sometimes it can even be small, small changes that you're going to make yourself. Or sometimes just even, you know, call some other people if you feel like, you know, um, you need fellowship with, you know, other people. And that you know, in and by itself is a change. You know, one of the things I'm talking about is the fact that, you know, there's some things like I can't, you know, pe some people tell me that, you know, I, there's that spiritual thing where if you have the illnesses, it's because you've caused them spiritually through something wrong with your spirituality which i think is not only incorrect but unethical and evil to say um yeah that's but, a very negative yeah i get that all the time because i'm very open about my my health issues and so i frequently get people saying oh well don't you think you caused this don't you think this is your fault because of something you did in a past life or because you made a mistake in your this life and this is what you get and i think that's super fucked up um and yeah, people, but they don't know any better. They're saying that because they often don't know any better. Um, but my, the point is, even if you are sort of, because I don't believe I can get rid of these autoimmune diseases with magic um, necessarily. I, I mean, I don't, I'm open to the possibility, but I'm not going to, I don't blame myself for the fact that I have them. You know, that would be, that would be in my mind very wrong. I don't, there's a better word for it, but you know. So, but I, so therefore, I think one of the things we can do, despite the circumstances of our corrupted and mortal frames that we are living this experience in, we can do magic to improve other people's lives as well as our own. So I do I spend a lot of time trying to help my friends. I do magic on my talismans and just give them to my friends to help improve their lives in ways that I may not be able to improve my own. Like, you know, I've been limping for two years and have to walk with a cane now. The, can't get medical treatment to save my life. No doctor will even talk to me the last two years in Canada because they've all quit or moved to the States because of the crazy laws we've just put in place. And we've just put in, we, we, we're, what we're doing is insane. I can't even tell you about it. It's so insane. But, um, you know, I may not be able to, you know, run a marathon myself, but I can do magic to help other people who have the abilities to improve certain things I can't improve for myself and help them with that. And so I think there's something we can always do, even if it's not for ourselves, it's for others. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Uh, I 110% I agree with that. That I don't believe that we're limited by the bodies we inhabit. That I believe that there is a greater spark within every human being that transcends the, the flesh that we're, you know, trapped within. So, yeah, 110%, I believe that. And that, you know, also every day that you wake up, that uh, you have an opportunity to make today different from what was yesterday. 
and that as long as you have that, then you have the ability to change all sorts of things in life. And, you know, even sometimes there have been days and opportunities in my life that I can't change certain things that I want to change, but in effect, I can, you know, obviously affect someone else's day by just even sometimes simple things, not even magic, just asking somebody how their day was and, you know, how their life is going, or sometimes not just listening to when other people want to, you know, just um, have somebody to just, you know, um, talk talk to, you know. And in this day and age, you know, I think that that is also a really big deal. Just have fellowship with people and don't feel alone. You know, it keeps you healthy and all, all kinds of things like that. Little things can also add up to quite a lot in totality. So any last sort of thoughts on the whole enlightenment of it all? No, I think I think we've kind of covered a fairly extensive list of com, uh, conversational topics. We talked about geomancy, we talked about magic and the enlightenment. We talked about GameStop and FTX. No, I yeah, I that was a surprise. I can't believe I, I'm stunned that we got into how did we how did that happen? I don't think I made it. I think it was organic. You know, you get two Aquarians. The archetypes of the Aquarians are the, the 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 genius, the revolutionary, and the exile. So you know, you get two of us together, and shit's never gonna go as planned, man. Too much, too much Uranus. <laughs> no, absolutely, and and I'm 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 happy to be here, and thank you for having me onto your podcast, Frat RC. Oh, it's it's, uh, it's been awesome. I don't even know how long we've been talking. Oh, I I think it was at least two hours yeah yeah hopefully hopefully yeah at least two hours so yeah it's been a delightful conversation thank you for having me yeah a pleasure um uh you got time for another question or two um sure what do you have well uh, maybe just a, a sort of say what spirits have you worked with that you particularly enjoy or found effective and powerful for you in your life that you could talk about any traditional spirits do you have any favorites <laughs> i don't i don't think i have favorites i can only tell you what spirits um i work with that have in some way shape or form been efficacious for me um i have worked with wasago and Gamori and the four kings and those have been the chief spirits that i have worked with and that those have been the spirits that have been Gamori especially in during the pandemic and to know that okay these are certain things that are happening and these are things that i would say information that i had gotten and things to do to keep myself and my partner, um, or rather my then partner safe when we were in uncharted territories. And Vasago also, I found to be a very helpful um, spirit to work with. What was the first one? I don't didn't recognize the name. Gamori. So who is that? Gamori is one of the spirits from the Goisha. Okay. Okay. And maybe I'm pronouncing it incorrectly. I'm some not a, a Goetic magician, so it's just unfamiliarity. Uh, some people, they say Gemory. Uh, I have always pronounced it phonetically, Gemory. Yeah, that's the thing about the Goetia is people uh, claim, well, Jake Stratton can't, of course, is says that if you want to make things really happen, you have to work with demons and goetic demons in particular though i think angels are just as effective but again i have no point for comparison right and i can i can only relay my own experiences and i think generally if you have i think sometimes the life that you've led or maybe the things that you've endured in your life good bad or otherwise I think that certain spirits are more readily available and they'll cohere naturally around the person's disposition in life. And a lot of my life has been struggle. It's been, you know, um, hardship. Um, it's been an uphill climb. 
as you know happens when somebody they they move somewhere and in those in those experiences i can only tell you that these spirits have been amenable when working and that the information i have gotten from both of those two spirits they have been i would say very effective in letting me know that during the pandemic these are the things that you need to do to keep yourself safe i've never gone off and ever done ritual work to say bring me this or bring me that a lot i know people that have that have worked with the goisha to do those things and usually it's it's kind of like these conversations in uh, with in uh, um in his basically in skinner's book these long drawn out conversations about okay i want treasure yeah but 50 other things that you need to know and i know other magicians that primarily the man who instructed me and his own working with spirits from the goisha and usually with treasure of spirits they involve long discourses and a lot of negotiating and a lot of back and forth a lot of if what then this that back and forth back and forth and it was not productive but in contacting certain spirits to inquire about what might happen if that is the disposition or that is the part of their office in those things those spirits seem to be very amenable mm. or in laying out particular things to do to keep yourself as a practitioner to keep yourself healthy about what might come around the corner especially during a pandemic in a pandemic whatever reservations i had about doing things sparing me uh, those went out the window because we were in uncharted territory and mm-hmm. in 20 you know all all hell broke loose for for lack of a better term and you know it was very traumatic for a lot of people to see you know so many friends lose their businesses lose their health and it was trauma it was very traumatic and at that moment i felt i had to do everything that i could to keep myself and my partner safe and my reservations went out the door and you know uh, these are the two spirits that i work with i can re- i can detail one opportunity one one particular time please and this, this was um okay so you know sometimes people they say the magic is all in your head and then lon milo duquette says but you have no idea how big you know your head can be or or something to that effect yeah okay so um as things got better and i experienced um a turnaround in my own life and i started to notice things were getting better and my my footing was on less shaky ground i during a ritual i asked how with gemori i asked how may i know that all of the things that i'm doing they're not just in my head that everything i've never had a full um i've never had a full manifestation of anything like that and that i could you know physical manifestation that i could verify typically when doing my own ritual work i've gotten some messages and so on but it's never been a full manifestation furthermore i don't know anyone that has i mean if there are people that are out there you know i would like to hear their their stories or or what to expect i have felt other things like a change in the air in the room in the pattern of the way the air was moving in the room a change in the atmosphere and so on and so forth temperature change but again i also being a materialist i know that psychosomatically those things they can also be from me maybe they're not really happening but psychosomatically my anticipation is creating that phenomena because i i also believe that you have to question you know what your results are and why you're doing anything in the early part of the pandemic you know i, I will admit you know my reservations flew out the window because i felt like if i get sick there's no plan b you know i need to do everything i can to be healthy 
as things got better, obviously, you know, as people are sometimes prone to do, I one time had a doubt and I thought to myself, okay, well, you know, maybe some things are psychosomatic. So I just asked aloud, okay, if this is all real and it's not in my head, then how may I know the truth of this? And I said, okay, if, if basically this is true and this is what it is, bring me a ring. You know, and that will be the measure of whether this thing is real or not. So anyway, I wrapped up the ritual, uh, did my license to depart. I did the lesser banishing ritual of the pentagram and so on and so forth. Did all of my rites. Okay, after the whole thing was over, I go to a thrift store, one that I frequent kind of often. And I go to this thrift store and I see this leather jacket and it looks really nice. It looks, you know, fairly brand new. So I take this leather jacket off the hanger and I put it on. And, you know, I'm looking at myself in the mirror and I'm thinking, yeah, this fits me. I put my hand into the pocket and there was a ring in the leather jacket. If you look at the profile picture wow. that I have up where I'm holding a ring to my face, that is the ring that was in the pocket. And that was the moment that I knew that, okay, that I believed in all of this stuff. I believe that what I was doing worked. I also, you know, as sometimes people are prone to do human weakness. Sometimes maybe you want a sign. Despite all of the things that occurred that you're safe, your material happenstance is improving. It's easy to have faith in things when your life is hard. It becomes sometimes slightly harder to muster faith when you're comfortable. At that point, you may have a doubt. And when I did ask for that proof, I can only tell you what happened. And that was what I pulled out of that jacket. And that was what I found. Anyway, make of that what Amazing. I mean. Yeah. yeah. I mean, you keep doing this stuff long enough, you, you will get those things. Those things will happen. You know, asking you shall receive, seeking you will find. Mm -hmm. Magicians who haven't ex had those experiences just need to stick with it. And then those things will, those confirmations will come, especially if you ask for them uh, or need them or something like that. Absolutely. I 110% I believe in that. And, you know, it's like that phrase, there is no atheist in a foxhole. And at the onset of the pandemic, I'm not going to lie, I was scared, you know, and when you're scared, you have faith in a lot of things. You can have faith that can move mountains. Obviously, when your life becomes a little bit better, you know, as humans are prone to weakness, you can sometimes wonder out aloud. And that was what I did. That was the result that I got. Um, interestingly enough, the ring has an image of a king with a lance upright and the king is astride a horse with the lance upright. And I was curious where this, it's a, it's a replica. It comes from a coin and the figure on the- Is it St. George? No, it's actually King Philip, I believe, who huh. was the father of Alexander the Great. Wow. And it comes from an old, I believe, coin from that part of the world that somebody had turned into a ring. Incredible. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, I know. Amazing. What is the Chinese of fine? It's not an antique ring. I mean, I can tell you that because I've showed it to people. Yeah. I've had it looked at. No, it's it's a replica from a coin. Somebody took the uh, image from the um, coin from antiquity and they transferred it to oh. the ring. And yeah. Oh. I can send you. I can send you the image of what. It yeah, looks let's like. use it for your uh, headshot. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that that is the picture that that you see. And yeah, I'm holding that ring to my face. Yeah, send me the pic so I can put it for the graphic of the episode. Yeah, absolutely. That's, That's amazing. Also, that is also a ritualistic gesture that I have used in certain rites. Um, Covering yeah. one eye. Yeah, I, so the I'll conspiracy theorists must love you. 
<laughs> of course, the conspiracy theorists probably love this whole episode, but they're already freaking out. They're like, no, you got to understand the details and typing away. <laughs> <laughs> so, thank you for having me on to your your podcast i i really appreciate being here thank you you're very welcome um one of the backers of your campaign uh who was also on this podcast uh doing a ghost hunting episode uh, a couple years ago uh uh soul garza my friend he yeah. asks this is a listener uh, a backer question to wrap up are there any things that beginners tend to do incorrectly or that end up confusing themselves and he says hello to both of y'all from uh, corpus christi texas uh, okay let's let's elaborate a little bit further about what does he mean in in particular when he's because he's he's backing your thing so i'm sure he's he's a he's a very skilled uh, uh, uh psychical and tarot reader already and so I'm, I'm very glad he's getting into geomancy. I think he's going to like it. So I'm glad he, he likes your campaign and is supporting you. And I'm sure he wants to get into it. And so he's saying, are there any things that beginners of geomancy, therefore, tend to do incorrectly or that end up confusing themselves? Ah, oh, OK. In relation to geomancy. Sorry. Yeah, because he's back in your campaign and he's curious about oh. He's, I'm no, sure, no. very excited to get the stuff and get into it. No, absolutely. Um, I think... People sometimes they tend to ask like really big ambitious questions when they first get into geomancy because they think okay well this is a highly accurate oracle um, you know how do I how do I solve something really big you know how do I find my true love yeah exactly you know and I would always start with smaller questions first and then learn the techniques um, learn meditate on the figures. I think meditation on the figures and their meanings and how they relate to other figures is very crucial in understanding interactions on a geomantic chart. That is key. And start out with simple questions first. As your proficiency grows, you can tackle harder and harder and harder questions. If you join the geomantic study group, there are people that look at football matches, they look at politics, they, they look at, they tackle some really complex questions. It's a great group. It's a great resource, but start small, you know, just like learn the figures, meditate on their meanings, ask yourself like some, some pretty like small questions and build up your proficiency from there. Don't tackle the big stuff first. Well, yeah, Johan, thank you so much for coming on. Do you want people to be able to find you on Instagram? I mean, yeah, people can find me on Instagram and if they if they're of a disposition to do that, yeah. Sure. Like, should we shout out your Instagram or not? No, if they find me, they do, and if they don't, I'm also fine with that. Thank you so much for coming on Magic Without Fears. It's been a pleasure. Oh, Thank you. I greatly appreciate it. Yeah, I hope you had a good time. Was there anything I uh, you wanted me to ask you that I didn't? No, no, I think we, we covered a wide uh, gamut of issues. And, uh, you know, I think anytime you put two Aquarians together, the conversation can go, you know, various tangents and so on and so forth. And, you know, it's always good to be in the company of a fellow Aquarian. Absolutely. I, I totally concur. It's always a treat to find out that my guest is a, an Aquarius. I found out mid-interview with Dr. Puka, she was an Aquarius, and I was like, oh, fucking A. <laughs> so, so I was just so I couldn't hide my excitement, I think. And uh people have been teasing about that ever since. It's like yeah, yeah, I, mean, I love Aquarians. We're the, we're awesome. Deal with it. <laughs> we're also no, the exactly. rarest. <laughs> <laughs> so your set looks beautiful. People go check out his his geomancy set. It's up for another 10 days or so on Kickstarter. Link is in the description below. And uh you're gonna be blown away by what it looks like. It's not the uh, it's not the cheapest thing in the world, but I, I'm sh it looks very well worth it. The materials look great, and uh, yeah, well done. If you, Thank uh, you. Foolish Fish, Thank of you. course, has covered it for people who want to see an in depth video analysis of the 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 the, the, the pictures and the images and all of that. Check out Foolish Fish um, if you don't know him already. So, thanks for listening, everybody, and uh, this has been uh, just a, a real treat. Yeah. From Vancouver to Kansas. Uh, have a wonderful evening, my friend. And I hope we stay in touch. Oh, absolutely. Stay I'm on sure after.
so we can we can talk okay um thanks for listening people give us a give us a review on apple podcasts if we get enough review on apple podcasts they might undelete the 150 plus episodes they recently removed of my podcast um otherwise check it out on spotify give me some five stars there and go to hermeticpodcast.com for all the episodes undeleted (laughs) and check out patreon if you want to buy me a coffee all right ciao